This world is not run by a democracy. It is run by a theocracy. It is not being run by majority vote. It is being run by the rule of one. In heaven, there are no debates. There are no caucuses. There are no primaries. There are no delegate votes. Just God. Why are the nations in an uproar? Why is the United States of America in an uproar? Why is Australia in an uproar? Why is China? Why is England? Why are the nations, all of the nations, in, in an uproar? And the uproar here pictures a, a state of unrest. There is a conspiracy. It is a satanic conspiracy. As they meet in G7, as they gather world leaders around the world, without actually a, a written agenda, yet it is written in their hearts to rebel against God. What they're saying is we do not want to be tied down by, by the law of God. We refuse to live by God's standard of morality. They want to be free from God. He who sits in the heavens laughs. It's not the laughter of humor. It's not the laughter of hilarity or joviality. It is the laughter of mockery and the laughter of derision at the absolute insanity of rebelling against God. That all of the nations of the world together would think that they can overturn what God has established and what God has built into this world. The Lord scoffs at them. He mocks them at their Lilliputian attempts to overturn His world. God will first person smite them. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall break them into a thousand pieces. You shall utterly destroy them. You shall devastate them. You shall crush them. You shall smite them. And you shall consign them to the lake of fire and brimstone. There's no delegating this out to the angels. Yeah. Hey everyone, welcome to episode I think 92 of Ransack and Reform. I'm Mark Ryan here with Daryl King. And we've been looking forward to this day for months, for a long time, yes. actually. <laughs> yes. Having a, a historic pre-mill uh night where we we go and we look into something, an alternative to left behind theology. Uh it could be nicknamed post-trib premillennialism some folks might nickname it uh but how is everyone doing here today yeah i'm doing great doing yeah. good doing good but i'm awesome looking good to forward see you to guys this. yeah great to have great to have all of you back on the channel with us tonight so we'll we'll start with the uh, reform berean to our right and then we'll work our way down just introduce yourself you know your your youtube channel and you know um yeah, that's 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 what we'll do, and then we'll dive into the agenda. Okay, so what's going on, everybody? Reform Berean, um, you guys. Uh, I've been on Dale's channel before, and uh, if you guys should check out my channel, Reform Berean, I talk about everything and anything in the Bible, Reform theology. Um, obviously, from a Reform perspective, I have uh, try and go through Ephesians Bible study right now on my channel, but. Yeah, just check out my channel and you'll see all the crazy stuff that goes on there. Awesome. All right, we got the resident doctor in the building. Go ahead, introduce yourself, man. Uh, me, you mean? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm Dr. Uh, Sungwok Chung at Denver Seminary. I'm uh, a professor of Christian theology and has been teaching theology and eschatology for the past 20 years at Denver Seminary. Yeah, it's it's great to be here with you guys. Excellent, excellent. So you you do teach uh, uh, eschatology at um, at Denver. Denver. Yeah. All right, but you you do have to you do have to present all views, correct? 
Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then you just narrow down to your view. <laughs> yeah, if That's... you if you do not accept mine, you're gonna get an F. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. that do, you, do you use your book as curriculum or no? I'm using my book, actually, you know, co-edited with Craig Lamberg, mm -hmm. a case for history premillennialism. And also I co-authored a book on uh, models of premillennialism with Dr. Matthewson at Denver Seminary. So, yeah, I'm using my own box for my class. Awesome. Awesome. And then, um, Pastor Greg, you want to take the floor, young man? Yeah, yeah. So uh, my name's Greg. Uh, my YouTube channel, it's not much of anything, really. You can find it at uh, youtube.com slash the epigon. That's T-H-E-E-P-I-O, no, E-P-I-G-O-N-E. -E. Um, that's a long story on that one. Uh, but, um, yeah, I... I right now, uh, my wife and I are members at First Baptist Church of Coleman in Coleman, Florida. Uh, I get opportunities to, you know, either fill in for our pastor or uh, uh, fill in uh, to do some pulpit supply. Um, I, I at least go to one, churches once, you know, whether there's a second time is a different story. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I, I, I'm just grateful that brothers can fellowship around the word of God being from different denominations, being from different uh, backgrounds, um, just different in general. And, and it shows that the body of Christ is very diverse, um, but we have love for one another. Um, so even though this is historic pre-mill evening, I do remember our eschatology evening that we had with like 10 people on the panel. And again, it was just awesome. Um, but yeah, we do have a Presbyterian in the house. We have a set of reformed assemblies of God in the house. We got a reformed Baptist in the house, and uh, Doctor Doctor Chung, what what, um, what denomination are yeah, you? Yeah, I'm of? A, I'm a more reformed person, and I'm now an independent pastor. Yeah. So you pastor as well as professor? Yes, yes. Yeah, I I was I have been a member of PCUSA, but I left uh, the denomination about a year ago. Okay. And then I'm now, you know, independent. Awesome. 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 Well, see, so that that is that is that is real cool. Uh, we do have an agenda to follow. But also, if you do have any questions in the chat, please drop them in the chat. Um, thank you very much, everybody, uh, for stopping through tonight. Really, really love to see everybody. Please do all the good YouTube stuff, like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff uh, to myself and Mark's channel as well. Uh, we are waiting. Uh, for one more, um, one more of our brothers. Hopefully, he can join us this evening. Thank you, Doki, for that super sticker. Really ap appreciate it. Um, but before we dive into historic pre mill, um, if someone wants to give a brief overview of the different uh, millennial views uh, within the Christian eschatology, if you could do that, maybe in like two minutes, three minutes tops, just giving a, a, a brief overview of like the four main views. Yeah, you know, uh, historic pre-mail uh, view it has uh, something uh, together with our mail uh, in terms of, you know, the timing of rapture. So we believe a post-tribulation rapture and uh, history pre-mail is different from dispensational pre-mail uh, in that dispensational pre-mill believes in uh, pre-trip rapture, right? So I think, you know, definitely we have some common ground with uh, dispensational pre-mill, but rapture timing is one of the major uh, differences between dispensational pre-mill and history pre-mill. And also uh, dispensational premillennialism gives privileges to uh, the Jews, right? But uh, history premillennialism does not give any privilege to the Jews. So I think you know, that they are major differences. And then our male position, they do not believe in any earthly millennial kingdom. And they believe only heavenly spiritual millennial kingdom, which is the same as the church age. So that's more our male position. And then post-millennialism is 
uh, uh, history, human history will go upward and will continue to progress. And then we will have the, the golden age at the end of human history. And that is the millennial kingdom. And after the millennial kingdom, the Lord will come. So post millennial return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you very much, Doc, for that. Mm -hmm. um, and what would you say, and this goes to anybody on the panel, um, you know, why is historic pre-mill, I guess, named that way? And where was it, I guess, in church history? So I don't, I don't know who wants to take take a shot at that. Well, it, it starts in the prophets. Uh, you know, say that. It, I say it starts in the prophets <laughs> and then it carries on over, you know, with our Lord Jesus and Amen. his apostles. Um, and then it just so happens that the first couple hundred years of church history, the guys who were especially closely connected to John, who wrote the book of Revelation, carried on a, you know, like, hey, there's going to be an actual kingdom of Jesus on the earth before the eternal state. And then suddenly, once we got more and more Gentile, as we became more Gentile as the church, we kind of lost our uh, understanding of the Old Testament and spiritualized it all. And uh, then, you know, Roman Catholicism just said, you know what, we're the kingdom now. And we just never got back out of it. That's my spicy take. That's your spicy take. I, I, Pastor Greg, I appreciate that. Um, shouts out to um, Sister Violet in the chat. I do want to share, and Sister, thank you so much for this picture um, that you posted on your in your community these past, uh, it was two days ago. So I'm going to share real quick um, Sister Violet's um, photo here. And somebody posted it on, on, um, on YouTube as well, on uh, Facebook as well. So I just want to share this real quick. I'm hoping that it does not mess up my uh video for any any reason but let me just share this real quick because what dr um uh resident doctor here shared earlier is just a, a breakdown of yeah breakdown of the, the the millennial view so hopefully you you all can see it hopefully you can still hear me and i'm hopefully not freezing but it should be coming up soon so this is like uh commonalities of what's shared and what's not shared uh -huh. um, maybe i can make it a little bit bigger just so um, everyone can see it i'm just gonna make it a little tiny bit bigger um there we go uh let me one more <coughs> but yeah okay so here's a chart here and it, again it shares what's commonality between all of us kingdom influence will be tangible and not spiritual only uh, final coming of Christ, resurrection, and full um, final judgment are still future. Again, so we sh we share that as brothers and sisters in the faith, all as catalogical views. Um, and then it, again, on this on the left hand side here, it breaks down post mill and the differences in the post mill camp, pre mill, and um, differences in the pre mill camp, um, and then also down at the bottom here, ah mill. Um, and it breaks down what our mills believe. And for the most part, uh, no one on this panel um, is full preterist. So um, <laughs> and I don't, I don't believe anybody in our chat is full preterist. So I'm very happy to, to say that uh, we still believe that what I just read in the middle, the final coming of Christ, the resurrection and the final judgment are still to come. So, uh, again, this is, you could find any chart or grid. You know, just Google it and you'll you'll see certain grids that look like this. So, um, again, Sister Violet, I do appreciate you um, for for dropping that. I saw that earlier. Um, so I just wanted to share that with 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 everyone. Um, but, yeah, shouts out to Pastor Ryan. I see you in the chat and Pastor Jeremy. I see you in the chat as well. Um, so we want to understand um, pre mill. So if someone could give a, a brief explanation of historic pre mill and it's like key beliefs. My my I'm next. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. Go ahead. So historic, just the key historic pre mill beliefs. Uh, yeah. Just um, you know, obviously we believe Christ will physically return 
before the millennial reign. Um, we believe in a we do believe in a rapture as a doctor mentioned um obviously but we we believe the rapture and the second coming are one single event um <clears throat> will be caught up and then christ will take us uh back down um also too we differ from dispensationalism that um there's no two separate peoples of god there's one people one people of god one set of people um you know neither jew nor greek um slave or free um, all are one in Christ, and we 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 would say um, all who are in Christ, they, they are now is Israel because if you are in Christ, you are in um, you are you are in the true Israel, which is Christ Himself. So, um, but yeah, those are kind of the more, most kind of that I can think of off the top of my head. Key distinctives of historic pre mill um, so far, yeah. And I would even add that you know, with this is that one of the distinctions between historic premillennialism and dispensational premillennialism is that what's happening now, like us being grafted in to Israel, mm -hmm. we're being grafted into an already thing that you know, something that was already happening. It right. wasn't a surprise. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, the shocking thing is that I, I don't, I don't see any Jews on this panel. So <laughs> that's the shocking thing. Mm -hmm. Is that God would it would have would shed His mercy abroad on the nations, mm -hmm. just like He said that He would do. That's and good. Yep, that's good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and uh, shouts out to uh, Montana Viking Mark. He he's actually reading uh, the Good Doctor's book. <laughs> True, I've got it in my hand right now. Got yeah, right now. oh great! Oh, wow, 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 wow! Wonderful. Yeah, and that, that is on my wish list on Amazon, but due yeah. to my wife, she won't let me buy it yet. Mine, <laughs> mine's mine's, mine's over to my right. It really is, actually. I, I read that some bit ago. Mm -hmm. It's it's in my shelf. Excellent. Oh, thank you Ooh. so much. Yeah. Bring up the charge. There might be a charge from our all millennial brothers out there. Hey, if you are if you're covenantal, you have to be all millennial. Mm -hmm. They would say the charge would be that's the consistent view. John Calvin. Uh, Mr. Warfield, you know, and company, they were, um, they were reformed. They were all millennial. They were covenantal. How can a person be, you know, we're not dispensational. We have a covenantal view. We have a view where there's unity between the old Testament, the new Testament. It's not, um, uh, you know, a, a chalkboard with a bunch of disunity where things are kind of being erased and everything, but how can a person be, covenantal and his you know premillennial uh any takers on that as yeah, virgin yeah absolutely no that's a that's a wonderful question i want to tackle with that you know um covenant at, i'm a covenantal theologian i'm a reformed one and i believe you know god's we have unity unity between the old covenant and the new covenant and also we have unity of god's God's uh, intention and his plan in terms of uh, the history history of the covenant, you know, from the covenant of creation or covenant of, of the kingdom in the Garden of Eden and the, the covenant of works and also the you know, covenant of grace after the fall, right? Genesis 3.15. And then we have covenant of grace with Abraham and covenant of works with Moses and covenant... Uh, with David and also the prophecy of the new covenant and the Lord Jesus fulfilled all the covenant, all the covenant expectations and anticipations and all the covenant promises. So all the promises are yes in Jesus Christ. So, you know, Christ is the fulfillment or fulfiller of all the covenant promises and blessings and, and prophecies and also uh, expectations and anticipations. So, I think a uh, covenantal, if you are an authentic covenantal theologian, I think you should be a history premier rather than a meal because uh, the Old Testament prophecy or promise about the kingdom of God is not merely spiritual. It is also physical, right? So yeah, both, yeah. both okay. spiritual and physical dimensions. So in my article, in my chapter in the book, actually you have just mentioned, I argued, Hey, uh, 
you know, I definitely respect my uh, uh, traditional reformed Amil uh, uh, brothers, but their understanding of the kingdom is too much spiritual, which means too much Gnostic from my perspective. Mm -hmm. So the kingdom must be both spiritual as well as physical. So because God blessed Adam and Eve uh, to be fruitful and multiplied and also subdue the land and also rule over everything, right? So that was the kind of kingdom commission, kingdom promise, Genesis 128. So that was fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the Lord Jesus will rule over the millennial kingdom, not only spiritually, but also physically. I think that's a very important issue here. Amen. If I could read this one uh, paragraph, actually, from your chapter, it's uh -huh. over the proto euangelion oh, which that's right. I've been glued to for the longest time. You know, with the question of was the proto euangelion was it fulfilled exclusively with Jesus Christ upon the cross, or or is it Christ upon the cross and His second coming as King, where you know death, Satan is, is destroyed essentially? But here's here's what the paragraph reads. Genesis 3.15, that's the Proto-Euangelion as the promise to restore the lost dominion. Right after the fall of the first Adam and Eve in the context of rebuking the serpent, God promised to send the woman's seed who would be the second Adam and the last Adam. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. The seed of the woman would come to crush the head of the serpent. He who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Since the devil's work is not only spiritual in its character, but also physical and institutional in its effects, we should interpret Genesis 3.15 as God's promise to restore not only Adam's spiritual rule, but also his physical rule on earth and in time before the advent of the new heavens and earth, which will be eternal. Clearly, this dominion will be exercised not by the first Adam, but by the second or last Adam as the representative of a new kind of humanity. Any thoughts there? Just I'm going to let him exegete himself. Yes and amen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, amen. It was, it, I, that part where you, you said about Christ having dominion, not over just the spiritual, but also the physical, um, like, in the in the intro on on my channel the uh the before the video uh i had i had one of me and mark's shows of a short where i was explaining like christ yes he rules and reigns now like yes and amen he rules and reigns now but i believe the scripture says that he will actually rule and reign physically on this earth as well um so like i i, I don't just take like oh he's gonna rule and reign in the millennial kingdom no he's ruling and reigning right now as king of kings and lord of lords Every knee is going to bow. Every tongue will confess that he is king and Lord. Um, so he's ruling and reigning now, but he will actually physically rule and reign here on this earth. And we will experience that kingdom of God here on earth when Christ is here with us physically. Um, so, yeah, uh, doctor, I, I fully um, in, in agree with what how you broke that, that scripture down. Amen. Amen. Amen to that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. If, if I may speak on this, it's, this is how I kind of, you know, one of the things that like processes through my mind is, you know, we're seeing, you know, the Jesus as the last Adam is it's him undoing everything Adam did, yes, sir. You know, that in doing so undoing all Adam's wrong and doing all of Adam's right that Adam didn't do. And so part of that is the, the subjection of the earth. The earth mm -hmm. is supposed to be subjected. You know, yeah. to man, to mankind, with mm -hmm. a an emperor, uh, really, you know, over it all. <clears throat> and I, I would say that all of the the tyrants through the ages, it's it's a sinful, it's a it's a twisted, it's a twisting of that um, creation mandate mm -hmm. that is then being attempted by men who don't deserve to rule the earth. And Jesus is going to be the one to rule the earth, and not just over the hearts of in minds of men, women, boys, and girls. And in, in, in many ways that, yes, he's, he's ruling and reigning right now. I, I think George Peters in his uh, 
theocratic kingdom makes, I think, a good point here is that Jesus in heaven ruling, well, he, he's God. Where else would he rule from? But as the son of David, as son of man, there's a different, like, let's not mix up the hypostatic union here. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. You know, like, that's part of the problem is like, we're, we're, if you think it's just purely spiritual, there's a mixing of the hypostatic union. Mm -hmm. And what we have, uh, my, the way I look at this, I think a good example of, of how to understand where my mind goes <laughs> is when Sennacherib, is at uh, when he has uh, not it's not Saraka but Rabshak or however you pronounce the the guy's name is at the walls of Jerusalem, and he's saying and he's mocking and he's jeering and he you know he's on, there on the behalf of Sennacherib, telling Jerusalem and Hezekiah you are conquered, you are conquered and guess what I'm going to destroy you and take so you can either come out and do what I say, and then you can be a part of the the Assyrian kingdom, or I can destroy you. That's what's happening right now, is that as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, we have gone to a conquered city. We're going to a conquered city over which Jesus Christ rules and reigns mm. as, you know, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we're telling them, guess what? This is Jesus's bow the knee yeah. and you, you get the blessings. Or wait till he comes back and you're going to bow the knee and you won't get the blessings. Mm, you get right. the curses. Right. Um, you know, and, but Jesus is going to rule and reign on the earth. Amen. And um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of how my mind works. Amen. You know, so, so his, pr pr historic premillennialists aren't um, negative. We're very victorious because yep. Yep. Our, our, we're, we're, we're not, we're not expecting the bride of Christ to do the job. We're expecting the Christ to do the job. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Actually, in relation to that, just I wanna I wanna emphasize before the fall. Okay, before the fall, what was God's original plan? God's original plan was establish his kingdom with Adam as as God's vice regent, right? Adam is God's vice regent, and God actually commissioned or in a way promised Adam, hey, be fruitful and multiply. And fill the earth and subdue the earth and rule over every living thing. Actually, you know, in the Reformed tradition, Genesis 128 has been interpreted, you know, cultural mandate. I I I, I don't I do not agree with that. Actually, you know, that Genesis 128 is a, a, is like a kingdom mandate. Okay, kingdom mandate under under Adam's rule and authority. Okay, and Adam's Adam's rule should be right both spiritual and physical so he had actually you know, god's promise or god's commission of adam to rule over every living thing in the context of of the garden of eden i think that is god's kingdom commission and that should be fulfilled not only spiritually but also physically i think that's very very important I, mm -hmm. in the beginning even before the fall god's plan mm -hmm was to have a physical and spiritual mm -hmm. kingdom on earth in the in the context of the uh, of the garden of eden right so we lost that but the, the second adam the last adam the lord jesus right fulfills and also you know, uh, does everything to to establish his kingdom his kingdom and, okay. and we can we can see that mandate yep. physically in that Hey, what does the Bible say? The righteous shall inherit the land. That's well, right. Adam, Adam was in the Garden of Eden, and uh, he was cast out because of sin. That's right. Um, yep. And Adam should have driven out the devil, the serpent, you know, when he was tempted. He should have done the right thing there, and he would have stayed in the land. Uh -huh. But instead, he disobeyed God, and he was cast out of the garden. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and we could visit other times in scripture with, with the Israelites. Hey, the, the righteous shall inherit the land. Well, they mm -hmm. disobey God. They mm -hmm. worship foreign idols and everything. Um, and they were eventually cast out of the land. And, and in, you know, in the future, the righteous shall inherit the land um, and the wicked will be cut off from the land. So, you know, that goes through my mind as well. Uh-huh. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. 
you know, uh, I'm millennial less. Actually, they will charge against us, you know, that, hey, the new heaven and the new earth uh, will have, you know, uh, will have also a kind of earth, right? Then why do we need the millennial kingdom? So I think, you know, <clears throat> sorry. The millennial kingdom is actually, you know, God's kingdom, Christ's kingdom, in the context of the earth and spatial temporal spatial temporal kingdom rather than eternal kingdom so I, I think we need to differentiate between the fulfillment of the garden of eden and you know god's commission to uh, commission to establish the kingdom and then after all god will bring his eternal kingdom, the new heaven and the new earth. Okay, so I think you know that we need to uh, differentiate between the spatial temporal uh, kingdom, uh, uh, you know, in in the millennial kingdom, and then eternal kingdom in the new heaven and the new earth. Can you, um, um, <clears throat> Doctor? Can you address Pastor Ryan's uh, question here? He wants the uh, understanding of of where where we stand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, um, I think this is very important. So uh, I uh, believe traditionally reformed people, including I really respect John Calvin and uh, Augustine, Augustine, right? And, and these are my theological mentors and definitely you know, Calvin is one of my favorite theologians. But I think in the reformed tradition, um, uh, unwitting, unwitting Gnostic tendency, which means too much spiritualize, too much spiritualizing God's mm -hmm. kingdom. So I think you know, I want to start, I want to start with God's kingdom commission before the fall. What was God's original plan to create Adam and Eve? That was actually, you know, uh, having Adam and Eve, right? rule over every living thing in the context of this spatial temporal world that was god's original plan so jesus through jesus christ god fulfills his original plan in the context context of time and space so by doing so god vindicates himself god reveals his power to fulfill his ori original plan uh, to have human beings or to have uh, uh, to have man as as his vice risen kings on this earth i think that's very very important and then his final his final consummation will come with the uh, eternal eternalized kingdom of god which is the new heaven and the new earth so i think the millennial kingdom is uh, is kind of a restoration of the lost garden of Eden in the context of space and, and time, uh, space and time. And then uh, eternal kingdom definitely will come with the Lord, uh, with with the Lord's consummation of all mm -hmm. uh, his plans. I do want to, um, again, I appreciate everybody watching tonight and coming through. Uh, we have uh, some historic pre mill in the chat. We got that post mill in the chat. We got some on mills in the chat. We do love y'all. Like um, our, my sister always says, please like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. Um, uh, Reform Berean, I, for anyone that's watching that is not a believer, that's not a Christian, um, can you share the gospel? I, I, I want to make sure that. Um, anyone that is watching that's atheist agnostic mm -hmm. not a christian can you share with them uh the, the good news of christ yeah <clears throat> so <clears throat> the good news of christ right that is the gospel that's what the gospel means is the good news and it's a good news because in order for there to be good news there had to have been something you know that that was bad right so that what was which was right we Apart before Christ came, right before, uh, if it wasn't for Christ, uh, there would be just judgment and wrath, right? Because God gave His law, 
right? He put it, he put his law on, on our hearts and he also laid it on stone, summarizing the Ten Commandments on the tablets and gave it to the uh, nation of Israel. And in that law, we cannot measure up, right? The Ten Commandments, I don't know if anyone has known the Ten Commandments, but, you know, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, and, and et cetera. We cannot, we cannot live, um, we, cannot we cannot fulfill it, and we can't live up to God's standards, right? We can't, because the Bible says we are born dead in our sins, right? And we have a corrupt nature from the fall of Adam, right? We are born dead in our sins. We are, we are in, we were in the second Adam. And so, right from the very beginning, God knew there had to be a perfect sacrifice to satisfy the wrath of his wrath so that way he can save his people. And so therefore, right from the beginning, right when you read Genesis, the fall of Adam and Eve, he prophesies to Eve of the coming of the one coming Messiah, the anointed one who will crush the head of the serpent. And from from the Old Testament on, you see uh, the picture being drawn more and more that the, the Messiah mm -hmm. is going to come. And to be that final sacrifice. And that Messiah, his name is Jesus Christ. And he is the God man, the son of God, the second person of the Trinity. And he came down to live the perfect life, to fulfill the law of God to its fullest. He lived the sinless life and he died the death that we all should be uh, deserved. Right. He died the death of a sinner and he bore the wrath of God upon him. He bore our sins. And those, and Bible says, those who believe in Him and put his, uh, repent of their sins and trust in Him, right? They shall have eternal life. So that I call everyone to to run to the mercy of the cross. And any, anyone who does not know, I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit, you are convicted by these words that we have sinned against the Holy God, and Christ has come down to die for sinners. And I pray you run and turn to Him. Amen. I, yeah. No, amen. No, amen. amen. Any, any anyone that's out there that's, that's watching that's not a Christian that, that does not know Christ as Lord as your as your King Master over your life, run to Him because th there's only there's only wrath that that you deserve as a sinner against a holy righteous God. There's only wrath, um, and there's only death. The Bible says that the, the the wage of sin, the cost of sin, is death against God. But the free gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord. So. Turn to Christ today, repent, and trust in the cross, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ today. And He's ascended. He 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 died. He rose. He walked this earth for forty mm -hmm. more days after His resurrection, and then He physically ascended into heaven. And then He said He's coming back one day to judge the living and the dead. Um, so, and that's what we're talking about the end, the end, the end of the end. Um, so, just if you're watching tonight, you don't know Christ as as your king of your life as the boss of your life i urge you we beg you repent of your sins and trust in the lord jesus christ Amen. and the promise of life with god is only through christ so just 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 turn to him um and again i just i just wanted to just just really wanted to uh uh to to bless somebody with with the good news tonight because um, this is an in-house talk as we're brothers. We could talk about these things because mm -hmm. we know we're going to see each other on the other side. We might mm -hmm. not see each other physically on this earth, but because we trust in Jesus Christ, not in our own goodness, but because we trust in Jesus Christ, that's the only way we're going to see God. And that's the only way we're going to be physically ruling and reigning and, and enjoying fellowship with one another, enjoying worship and fellowship with God forever. Amen. But without Jesus, mm -hmm. there's only wrath to come. There's only God's damnation on your soul. And that's because you sinned against a holy, righteous God. So trust Jesus tonight. Um, I, I, I just wanted I just wanted to get that out. I saw a comment earlier and I just I hope he's still watching. Um, I really hope he's still watching. And, and whoever else is going to watch this five years from now, I hope they they come and to know Jesus as, as their Lord. Um, so praise God. Um, Back, back on topic, brothers. Um, back that is the topic, topic man. That, that, is, is, that topic. is the topic. Yes, that is the topic. And I see, I see one of my coworkers in the chat. Shout, shout out to my brother Berto. Good to see you, brother. Um, but I want to go to Revelation twenty, um, and I'll read uh, verse one through seven. And then, if somebody wants to just walk through this scripture with us, um, or exp you know, ex exposit it, that'll be great. Um, but Revelation 20, verse 1, it says, Then I saw an angel coming from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain 
and he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Verse four, then I saw thrones and seated on them were those who to whom the authority to judge were was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who have been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God and those who had not worshiped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or on their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. But will, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So again, Amen. brothers, I don't know who wants to exposit that scripture, but there's there's so many good things that were said in, in that scripture. I see Pastor Greg chomping at the bit, so I'm going to let yeah. Pastor Greg at it, yeah. and then I know I, I, doctor, I'm going to let the good doctor at it too. Yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, how, how do you not want to jump at this one? I mean, we could either take it as just say what it says, um, which is what I'll do is so what we I mean, one of the one of the problems that you have here is, is there a disconnect between the end of 19 and the beginning of 20? Um, I would say no, there isn't. And it's very there's there's a continuity between especially beginning in uh, ch verse 11 of chapter 19 rolling through. You see Jesus coming back. And him, you know, Merck and his enemies, you know, there's a bloodbath left and right. Mm -hmm. And what happens is he comes and one of the, you see Satan, who we're told prowls around like a roaring lion right now, that he's the, the god of this world, uh, you know, the, the prince of this age. And he's, he's then chained whatever that fully means. I don't know. And frankly, God didn't tell me enough, so I'll just take with what he said. He tells me he's going to be chained, so he's going to be chained. One of the things I find amazing about that is that we're, if, we're, if we're supposed to believe that Satan is currently bound in the abyss, why in the world, if, if some way, somehow, you've got the, the arch enemy of, of all humanity, He's put in this abyss, and it, the way that it reads is that he is he is th bound, he is thrown into the abyss. He wasn't lightly placed there. He was yeeted into the abyss. He's it's shut over him and it's sealed over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer. What was the deception? Well, it was the nations were deceived not only spiritually. But they were deceived to think that they could actually fight against the coming conqueror. And so one of the things that happens because Jesus is because Satan is bound and Jesus is ruling and reigning, there's no more war. That's part of Satan's deception. Hmm. What I find astonishing is if we're told, well, he's this being thrown into the abyss, that chains like a, a really long dog chain. You know, he's just allowed to kind of go around, but he's He's, you know, he, he's under control, but he's just got a really long chain. Then why was Legion so afraid to go to this place? Because this is where, when Legion encounters the encounters Christ, not as the risen Christ, but as in his first coming, Legion goes, don't throw me into the abyss. Please don't throw me into the abyss. If this is not nothing but a minimum security prison, why is a Legion scared out of his mind? Hmm. Or it's this is the place where you don't really want to go. And so, you know, I, I see that. So, I mean, there, there's those questions that I've got. And then you see, again, you have, you know, God's people are, are ruling and reigning on the earth, which um, for our, for the hashtag that post meal boys, um, if you go read boys and girls, uh, yeah, you know, boy, yeah, boys and girls. Uh, mm -hmm. That if you read Matthew Poole's commentary on, on this passage, what is actually quite intriguing is that he goes and says, I don't really know what this means. <laughs> he go, but he ends up taking the post-mill position because I don't really know what this means, but 
it appears that the promises here are that God's people will rule and reign on the earth, either with Christ, you know, spiritually reigning in heaven and us, you know, somehow, you know, through, uh, you know, the whole post mill system, or it's because Jesus came back that we're ruling and reigning on the earth. So I'll, I'll take, you know, Matthew Poole's honesty there and go, you know, you're right that we are going to rule and reign on the earth because that's what we were promised. God said that it would happen. So, you know, I, I was listening to something recently that said, um, you know, excuse the, uh, the candor and crassness here, but it was uh, a little old lady who had gone up to a guy who was historic pre-male and he goes, you know, sir, you're, you, you're right. If this is the kingdom that we're supposed to be living in right now, the promised kingdom of Christ, that this is what we were promised, it sucks. You know, you know, and that that's where I'll, I'll go with it. I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking. <laughs> doc, doc, let, doc, let the good doctor um, go. The, the good doctor. I do have, I, I want you to break down. Um, I have two questions for you. I have that one question from our sister Violet. Um, you know, I know you're independent now, but are you, are you going to a different Presbyterian, um, denomination i hope you come to the pca i'm just that's my shameless that's my shameless plug and i can then i can see you in i can see you in june at our at our uh our uh our general conference but that's the first question where, where you go where, where are you going if you're going anywhere and uh -huh. then i also want you to break down you know revelation 20 but then i also had a question brother martin had a question earlier um about uh and i think uh um uh uh, Professor uh, Schreiner is that new creation, and we—that's a whole nother conversation. The new creation, historic pre-mill, yeah. but will only believers be in the millennium? So you can answer that question right there from Sister Violet, and then will only believers be in the millennium? And then we we can break down Revelation twenty. <laughs> and yeah. is, there, is there death in the millennial? You know, there you the, go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you for that question. Actually, you know, I'm not thinking about joining any denomination. You know, I want to be uh, independent. I want to remain independent because I have seen a lot of uh, pitfalls and and problems of of denominations. So, yeah, just I want to be uh, independent. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that question. And uh, and also in terms of uh, you know uh, uh, Revelation 20, definitely. Uh, Greg, uh, uh, Reverend Greg, you got you got it uh, correct. Actually, you know, Satan is not Satan is you know Satan seems not completely bound right now. He is wildly and widely working powerfully, you know, like a roaring roaring lion. Right? He is working powerfully among you know uh, non-believers and also. Uh, even even against believers, he is doing every every evil thing, every evil thing as powerfully as possible. What about abortion? What about uh, transgenderism? You know, what about all kind of wars and, and terrorism and war war between Israel and Hamas and mm -hmm. and war between Ukraine and Russia? Know, all kinds of wars are going on. What about, you know, I'm I'm from South Korea. What about North Korea? North mm -hmm. Korea dictatorship, right? Mm -hmm. Complete control of North Korean people, 20 million people under the dictatorship of Kim dynasty. I think, you know, in a sense, Kim dynasty of North Korea is, is a model of of uh, antichrist, antichrist, antichrist. Actually, his his uh, final role over the Babylonian kingdom, global Babylonian kingdom, before the Lord's second coming. So I think the devil is not okay. Devil is not completely bound, as uh, Genesis, uh, Revelation chapter twenty reports. Then. I think chapter 20 must be interpreted from a futurist perspective. And also there is a chronological order between uh, chapter 19 and chapter 20, as you know, 
in chapter 19, when the Lord comes again, the Lord will throw away the beast and the false prophet into the lake of fire. And then Satan, Satan, after his, his release at the end of the millennial kingdom, he will be thrown finally into the lake of fire and he will find the beast and the false prophet are already there. Mm -hmm. So there's a, 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 a chronological order you know, between chapter 19 and 20. You cannot get chapter 20 back to the first coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. No, that, you know, chapter 20 should be about, should be related to chap, uh, to the second coming of our Lord Jesus. Yeah. Amen. So, and then the, the, the main question on the floor, which, which uh, lit up my brother, Montana, um, will there be death in the millennium? <laughs> what, what, say, what say you, doctor? What say you? Will there be death? Is the millennium only for believers, or will there be still unbelievers roaming this world? World, world. What, what, what say you? Yeah, that's a wonderful question, and I think you know Satan will be bound during the millennial kingdom, right? So sin will be uh, uh, what will be uh, controlled, and and the Lord Jesus will uh, rule over everything in the millennial kingdom. So. Will we have a death in the millennial kingdom? I do not think so. I think, uh, you know, uh, definitely the question, who will be there? It, it, it is still debatable. But I believe resurrected believers and also you know, non-believers will be there together. And then non-believers will continue to, you know, reproduce. And then actually they they will be tempted again and they should choose christ or or evil right at mm -hmm. the at the end of the millennial kingdom when the satan is released so i do not want to believe there will be death in the millennial kingdom i think the world will have continuous uh of uh, being fruitful and be multiplied in the millennial kingdom and then gog and magog actually you know uh the rest, uh, the, the 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 numerous descendants of the uh, of of natural, you know, human beings in the millennial kingdom, and they will continue to uh, reproduce, and then they will be faced with with their final opportunity to choose Christ over right over evil, mm -hmm. with with <clears throat> Satan's Satan's release. I think that's you no, know, that's the picture that I have in my mind right now mark did you have a follow-up to that no i i mean i had a, a poll on my channel hey will there be death during the millennial reign it was split 50 50 um you know and the audience is more reformed i would say um yeah. and i just found that oh whoa i mean 50 50 it's pretty uh, you know mm -hmm. they're definitely not a consensus on that you know for sure so uh, Pastor Greg, go ahead. Yeah, I've got so I've got a so here's where I look at this is Isaiah 65. It says, uh, for I behold, I am creating a new heavens and a new earth. So before I get into that, I will say that I think that there's the possibility of death. That mm. I think it's the possibility is there. And so it says, For behold, I am creating a new heavens and a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered or come upon the heart. But be joyful and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing and her people for joy. I will also rejoice in Jerusalem and be joyful in my people. And there will be no longer, uh, there will no longer be heard in her the voice of weeping and the voice of crying. No longer will there be an in, in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not fulfill his days. For the youth will die at the age of 100. And the one who does not reach the age of 100 will be thought accursed. They will build houses and inhabit them. They will also plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They will not build and another inhabit. They will not plant and another eat. Uh, I would take, this is how I understand it. This is how I look at it. That I think there's the possibility that the wages of sin being death, based on what Jason's question here is, and that sin is under control. The reason it's under control is because Jesus is ruling with an iron rod. And so when you have somebody who rebelliously steps out of the line, 
he doesn't have, you don't have to wait for 10, you don't have uh, somebody have to Epstein himself. Um, you know, you don't have to worry about somebody having dirt on the Clintons. You, it is instantly and instantaneously just judgment that would come upon the sinner and because he's ruling with an iron rod. So if the person, and I take this where he says that the person who doesn't reach 100 years old is thought accursed, I think that they're looking going, how did this guy live so little? Mm -hmm. sure. he, mu he must have actually sinned and instantly received his wage. Um, whereas if you basically stay in line and follow the king's orders, there's nothing but blessing to come, and you just keep living. Is mm -hmm. is is how I is how I will process it. And Greg, if I could interrupt, you know, would you say believers then zero believers during the millennial reign will die then? Oh, absolutely. I absolutely. I don't think a single believer. You know, even if they okay. let, let's say it's a believer um, that I mean, obviously the ones who were caught up in the first resurrection aren't going to die. You know they're they're ruling and reigning. You know they're they're Christ's governors over the earth. Um, the, the, those who let's say, for instance, like the Jews that are going to look upon him whom they've pierced, the ones that believe, I believe they're just going to keep on going. Mm. You know they're just going to keep on living, and that those who come to faith during that time are just going to keep on going because what do I have to rebel against? But it's those whose hearts have not been changed. Those who have not believed, you know, have not. You know, maybe they're bowing the knee physically because the king's ruling with a rod of iron, but they haven't bowed their hearts as we see at the end of the millennium that there are those who will rebel. Um, that if they, as long as they don't get out of line, they'll keep living, even mm -hmm. though their hearts aren't changed. But those whose hearts have been changed won't die, period. And then whatever happens there at the end of the millennium and there's an instantaneous you know, new, new creation body. I don't know how that'll, that'll play out, but that's yeah. how it goes in my head. Uh, I, I just want to add too. like, I, I just can't get over how one can sit, think Satan is bound now um, with so many passages uh, of just resist the devil, resist the schemes of the devil. Ephesians six, uh, put on the whole armor of God. You may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Like that mm -hmm. is for us right now. If, if Satan is bound, and he's not deceiving the nations, you know, wh wh who are these passages for, you know? Yeah. I just think it's very evident that Satan is not bound right now. I do. I do want to give uh, the, the good resident doctor uh, some time. Cause I know he probably has to leave uh, shortly. So I do want to give him uh, some last words before he leaves. And then also if you could, if uh, pastorally as a pastor, um, being historic pre-male, how does that play out practically in life? Yeah, thank you for the question. You know, uh, in Christ, I am a bride of Christ, and also the church is the bride of Christ. So as the collective bride of Christ, we are anticipating the Lord's second coming eagerly, So, which means actually you know, we have eschatological consciousness on a daily basis, which means we can walk with Christ who is already within us, right? Through the Holy Spirit, he indwells us. So therefore, spiritually, we enjoy our walk with Christ. But but still, we are waiting for the Lord uh, in person, right? So actually, you know, uh, history, history, history premillennialists actually are more uh, eschatologically conscious. They are alert and watchful. And they want to walk with Christ spiritually here and now, but they are still waiting for the Lord's second coming. So I think you know, we have the, we can keep the balance between our life on earth and then our anticipation and hope for uh, for the uh, for the Lord's second coming. So I think history premillennialism is is the most balanced position. Our male position emphasizes uh, the already. Right, and some dispensationalists may emphasize the the not yet, but we want to say both the already and but not yet. Both are important because we are covenantal as well as premillennial. So I think the the history premillennial position is most balanced position, 
and also it helps us to walk intimately with Christ on earth and also have anticipation, anticipation, uh, earnest anticipation for the Lord's second coming, who, who is our bridegroom. Amen. Amen. That's, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. I, you know, when you, when you were talking about, you know, the millennial reign of Christ, like it, it's, we can, we can look to see like, yes, our Lord is coming back. Yes. Our King is coming back. And, you know, it, it will be a, a, it will truly be that golden age that we're really all longing for. Like no more. I mean, it's, it's, it, Christ will be actually ruling and reigning in the midst of his people here on earth. And it's just like, you, I'm looking forward to that day um, because it's just like it, it is not going to be perfection because we still have, you know, the devil's still still going to be thrown into the lake of fire. But like it's, it's, it's a picture or it's, it's a foretaste of the new heaven and new earth where it's like there's no more sin. There's no more temptation. There's no more death. There's there's no more pain. There's no more suffering. You know what I mean? Um, and and we no longer have to to fight our sin you don't have to no longer have to fight just life in general because life sucks sometimes <laughs> um so like I, i'm i'm excited and anticipating uh, the day of, of the lord um so in the historic pre mill scheme when does time cease and eternity begin pastor ramsey just threw that bomb in the bill <laughs> Love you, Claude. I'm sorry. I think I need to leave. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for you guys and God bless you and see you again. Okay. Grace and peace, brother. Thank you so much, man. Thank you, Dr. Chung. All right. So, yeah. Who wants to take that question right there? Let's go. I <laughs> I love you, Claude, first off. Mm. Uh, Come on now. Come all right. On. So, uh, you know, I would say that, I mean, the question, eternity doesn't actually begin. Eternity is eternity. Um, so we've, you know, we've already, I mean, it, it's the question of when do we in, in this present, you know, in the, I would say that in dealing with the new heavens, and new earth, it's really that that's the question. Um, you know, and, and we just keep following through that at the end of this uh, millennial age, you know, that, that at, at the final judgment, and there's a new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem. That the the in the ultimate end goal of it all, you know, comes into play. So hopefully that makes some sense. Yeah, I, I want to go back to thank you, uh, Pastor Greg, for answering that. I do want to go. I don't know if um, Karina. I think that's her name, Karina, um, Miss mm -hmm. Briggs. Um, uh, Elias, you you know her? Yes. Okay. All right. So all right. So, but yeah, if, if any if everyone could just uh keep keep that sister in, in prayer. Mm -hmm. Um she uh yeah. that is she, my uh actually my she's my cousin, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's what's up. That's what's up, that's what's up. So if anybody could just keep that sister in Sorry, prayer. I was texting my texting my wife real quick. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> it's, it's, it's yeah, that, that is my cousin, yeah. And she okay. she asked she asked some great questions, even when I'm with her in person, um, yes, keep keep her in prayers. Yeah, and her her, her family. She's married, has a has a son. So yes, so, yeah. So keep the, keep her in prayer, and you know, uh, pray that because um, I saw what she was asking for Bibles and stuff like that. So you 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 already got contact with her. So good. Oh good, yeah, good, yeah. Good, good. I'm I'm, yeah. I'm I'm happy to hear that. Um, yeah. and hopefully she has a good local church that she's uh, can can go to and be a part yes. of. Yeah. Um, but uh, I I do want to uh, stay stay on topic and um go uh, i guess maybe segment four here um so practical Im implications of historic pre-mill for christian living and ministry today um how, you guys want to take a stab at that um i just kind of it, it might sound simple a simple question i just feel like it's a common sense thing where christ is coming we don't know when um could it be soon it could be a thousand years from now we we, we don't know um let's just go preach the gospel uh, to the lost. I just think that's a common thing. So that's something that's practical. I think it's simple. You know, it, it just, I, I feel like it, it just pushes me more to preach the gospel knowing as, as me being a historic pre, pre mill. Amen. Amen. Mark, what do you, what do you, uh, what do you think, brother? Uh, practical implications. You know, it, 
it fuels it's fuel of the fire in that I think we get right what classical dispensation uh, dispensationalists where they really make a you know major departure from God's word. Christ is ruling and reigning today, mm -hmm. um, and so that that fuels our Christian walk. Um, and so it's the it's the already not yet uh, yeah. kind of thing. Christ is ruling and reigning here today. Um, he lived the, the perfect life that we could not live. He was righteous, the only righteous one. Uh, I was just writing today on Facebook. There is none righteous, no, not one. Um, mm -hmm. Only Jesus Christ is, and the righteous shall inherit the earth. Well, ultimately, it's Jesus Christ, the righteous one, who inherits all the earth Amen. and as he lived a righteous life what does he do ask of me and i will give you the nations he inherits all the nations of the earth the entire earth is his inheritance as his heritage um you know and so what fuels me is hey the nations belong to jesus christ all 50 states they belong to jesus christ this earth the land belongs to the righteous um, and those who have the imputed righteousness of not our own righteousness, but the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, you know, and so that's what fuels um, a lot of my just energy in witnessing and in meditating on what what is to come. So awesome. Awesome. Pastor Greg, I want to um, yeah. ask, ask you for practical uh, practical implications on life as a historic pre-mill and then also uh following that following up with that um outside of uh, revelation 20 what are two or three proof texts for historic pre-mill okay so so practical implications i, I, I want to think pastoral implications here yep so you know we know um that kind of the overwhelming in the evangelical landscape, the overwhelming um, predisposition, eschatologically speaking, is towards some, you know, form of pre-tribulationalism. Um, I, you know, I'll say I, I'm a graduate of the Moody Bible Institute, so I've, you know, I've got that, you know, there. Um, you know, that is a that is a haven for pre-tribulationism, and. But the here, one of the questions that when I kind of had as a default being pre-trib, which I, I mean, I really didn't, I held that loosely. Premillennialism was like a, a non-negotiable for me. The pre-trib part of it was negotiable because that was just kind of a default. I figured that's all that there was mm -hmm. uh, after I became a Christian. But I, you know, one of the things I thought was, well, what if I'm wrong? what if there is no pre-trip rapture? Mm. What happens when this antichrist shows up and I haven't been taken out? Will I be able to stand? Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things, you know, once you kind of, you're able to start wrestling with that. So a pastoral implication, you know, even if, you, if you're dispensational, you're pre-tribulational and, you know, you just, you're dyed in the wool in that as a especially as a pastor what i would say is at least say if i i could be wrong on this because there is a difference in thought that should i be wrong do not deny jesus christ do not think that he was slack on his promises mm -hmm trust him because he did say he would come back and get you that's right like he he, he didn't stutter on that part that's right um he he's going to come back he's going to get you he will rescue you but i as i you know think you know i admit you know i, I think that we are substantially closer to the to the end um, I, I mean, I really do think that we're probably on the doorstep of it if, it if it hasn't already kicked in in some way. And we're just on that first, you know, night, somewhat nice three and a half years, first three and a half years. Um, I don't know. 
But should that be the case that we have to endure until we see that glorious appearing, which is actually, that is what the, the New Testament presents as the, as the, the blessed hope. It's not the pre-trip rapture. That's right. It's it's the blessed it's the blessed appearing. It's the glorious appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And if if that is the hope, let's let's like together with you know not only the the, the varieties of pre mill, our all mill brothers, our post mill brothers, you know our brethren there, and say you know what we're going to look to Christ. We can have an in house debate like this, mm-hmm. and encourage one another to endure amen um so i think that's one thing second you know from a historic pre mill position now i think that it actually something that it, it allows us for the reading of the bible from genesis through revelation to read it the same way and to go into the new testament in particular leaving the old coming into the, you know, leaving the law, the prophets and the writings and coming into the writings of the apostles and maintaining the same ideas that there's a continuity in the text, you know, that it's one story being told and that I don't have to sit there because, you know, let me, I read, I was reading this earlier to you guys, but this was a a quote from Lorraine Bettner in um, the meaning of the millennium for views and his response to the dispensational pre-mill view. But he says that, um, you know, in attempting to reply to Hoyt's interpretation of the millennial kingdom, I shall not deal with the individual prophecies. In skipping down, here's what he says. This disagreement between him being a post-mill and Hoyt being a a dis-be pre-mill, says this disagreement arises primarily because of the different methods of interpretation. It is generally agreed, this is Bettner, post-mill guy, Bettner says, it is generally agreed that if the prophecies are taken literally, speaking of the the Old Testament, as we would call it, if the prophecies are taken literally, they do foretell a restoration of the nation of Israel and the land of Palestine with the Jews, having a prominent place in that kingdom and ruling over the other nations. And so, to which I say, well, why not read it that way? Because I don't know how, I don't know how to read the Bible any other way than that because it does the, the the gospels don't make any sense liberals are able to go in if you you take your spiritualization and allegorization too far jesus doesn't even rise from the dead he just rises from the dead in your hearts or something like mm. that yeah you know so it's maintaining a, a con- as best as my fallen heart and mind can do trying to maintain a consistent hermeneutic from Genesis through Revelation and just reading it like I would in the other book and realizing, oh, this isn't like any other book. This is God's book. Amen. So that's, there's that. Um, so you want me to, uh, like, other proof texts that I've got? Yeah, just two or three proof texts, yeah. And then I'll uh, go, go around, go go to Brother uh, E2 after you. Uh, Deuteronomy 32. And um, is a good one because that la- that really lays out the the history of what Israel would endure, um, and how I mean, just Deuteronomy thirty two is good. Like I, I look at that and go, God hasn't forsaken Israel, and He has not forgotten His promises, mm-hmm. which we as Gentiles have been made co heirs with Christ in those promises. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I just gotta go, I'm going to have to go Zechariah 14 because uh, I mean, really no, no other system makes sense of Zechariah 14 without you having to really do an injustice to the text and kind of throw it out there. You know, when we, the, again, the new Testament the New Testament, there's not a New Testament superiority. There's a continuity between the law, the prophets, the writings, and the apostles. And, you know, they're all, they all have the same author, the Holy Spirit. And he's not changing the way he, he's writing from covenant to covenant. Amen. All right. All right. Brother E, what about you, man? Well, I can think of, as for an historic pre obviously... And my thinking, I, I always like to differentiate from 
a dispensational pre mill because I think us as a story pre mill, we always got kind of get lumped in by some on mill and post mill guys. Uh, yeah. We get lumped in with the his, uh, and so to kind of differentiate differentiate where um, this is this is actually a warning, right? To this is to warn believers, right? So all my dispensational dispensational preacher. Uh, believe it brothers and sisters out there uh first john 2 18 tells us of 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 that that antichrist which is coming right and so there have been many antichrists have come therefore we know that it's the last hour so he's warning that there will be a, a one antichrist before the second coming of the lord right the coming of the lord and so i i just think whereas that and just many others um many other patches uh speaking of the antichrist i just feel like if 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 we're caught if we're caught up before the tribulation and we're never going to see the antichrist, why 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 is he warning believers to hey keep an eye out? We have been there have been many, and but there is going to be the, that antichrist, which historic premiums agree. Like there are there are many antichrists, well, and obviously before the second coming there will be that final antichrist um, there. Um, but yeah, that's what this is one first uh, first John chapter two verse eighteen when he gives that warning. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. All right. Well, I, I, I don't want to give my, um, get, you're on my panel. I don't want to give my, uh, <laughs> proof text, but I, I do want to, um, just encourage any believer that's watching, whether you're dispensation or whether you're historic pre mill, whether I mill hmm. post mill, I don't know. I do want to, I do want to encourage you or pan mail. Um, I do want to encourage you with this scripture. First Thessalonians chapter four, verse 13. Mm. It says, but we do not want you to be uninformed brothers mm -hmm. about those who are asleep that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not proceed those who are fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Mm -hmm. And those, and then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So will we always be with the Lord. Verse 18, therefore, encourage one another with these words. So I, I just want to encourage any believer that's watching, any believer that's watching on the replay gang. I want to encourage you with those words. If the dead in Christ, if they died in Christ, you will see them again. They are with the Lord. They will get their new bodies. If you are in Christ and, and life is tough, life is rough know that the lord is coming back know that there will be another uh, there, there will be a glorious day when the, the king of kings and the lord of lords will come down rule and reign he will be your king mm -hmm. and you will be his you will be in his kingdom like there will there will be no more sin there'll be no more temptation there'll be no more death there'll be no more sickness there'll be no more depression there'll be no more anxiety there'll be no more stress jesus christ will be the king and lord and he's coming back so I want to encourage you with that. So if you're feeling down, if you if you if you're like life just sucks, I don't know what to do. Be encouraged. The Lord is coming back. That's He promised to do so. Mm -hmm. And and Titus says God never lies. God never lies. He promised He's going to come back. And when He comes back, He it will be a glorious day. So I want to encourage you that the King is coming. The King is coming. Um, I. That's that's my last words for the evening, brother Mark. I know you always have the last word and want the last word, brother. But did you did you have anything else that you wanted to talk about this evening? I thought we we completely skipped over. This was segment one, uh, development in the early church fathers. Um, um, and I, I've go. said it before. Let's go. Know, if there's anything that keeps me up at night that gives me nightmares with historic premillennialism. If there's anything, it would be the Olivet Discourse. Um, why? Because I'm not satisfied with any view completely answering it. I'm just not, to be honest. Um, mm -hmm. 
But if there's something that should keep our post millennial and all millennial people, you know, awake at night and give them nightmares, I think it's this first thing, and that would be the early church's embracement mm. of historic premillennialism. Um, that's what should keep them awake up, you know, yes. at night, I think. Um, now, why so? Let me, uh, Dr. Dr. Chung. Uh, or Sung Wong Chung. There we go. Um, he's been on here before. Um, and I believe it was him who I've heard, you know, mentioned before up to arguably, this would be just an argument, up to 85% of the early church was historic. We would classify as historic pre mill. You know, that's an argument. People, a lot of people would reject that. Um, but it was the majority view of the early church um in this book a, a case for historic premillennialism mm -hmm. uh, they'll, they'll go on to say that um it'd be for now the point is that justin the greatest of the second century apologet uh, apologists and Irenaeus, the first great theologian of the church both believed that a physical earthly kingdom of Christ after his return. They were both historic pre-mill. Uh, Tertullian as well. Tertullian. Tertullian. Uh, Polycarp. We, Ignatius. Polycarp. We Ignatius. can name the people, Apostle John. We can name people who studied <laughs> at the feet of the Apostle John who were historic premillennials. That's what yeah, they maybe, would be classified yep. as. And so, you know, your post-millennials, they would say, well, uh, the apostle John was, he was post-millennial. Well, if people who learned at his feet were objectively, they were historic pre-mill, objectively they were, then the apostle John wasn't a very good post-millennialist in communicating his view. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but the early church, um, you know, if you do, those who do read the book, um, Dr. Sung Won's uh, chapter, chapter seven that's a great chapter chapter six whose side was the early church on um that that's a very good chapter as well and let me say too don't want to go down too many rabbit trails but you know years ago i remember pastor jeff durbin preaching against dispensational premillennialism mm -hmm. uh, in the secret rapture and he came against it saying, hey, that, that's Gnostic and it's full of escapism. You know, in, in this book, they point out how um, historic premillennialists, they um, had arguments. They argued, they used premillennialism historically, the early church did, to argue and confront and reject Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. um, and that is a... That should be a powerful argument as well. And as Dr. Uh, Chung was here, um, you have Origen, who would be a millennial, and Augustine, who arguably, maybe you could say were, were diet Gnostics, or uh, there was a heavy de-emphasis on uh, the physical kingdom and a heavy, heavy emphasis on the spiritual kingdom. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, and, and Mark, to your point there, because um, mm -hmm. this is, I mean, this is kind of the thing. I'm like, guys, if, if you know the whole idea about you know semper reformanda, obviously we're trying to get back to the Bible, right? In that statement, you know, we were always wanting to reform, but you know, one of the things that we when we when we're doing that is we want to say like we're not coming up with something totally new here. Mm -hmm. That there are those in the past, other, you know, mm -hmm. you know, the spirit of God worked through these people in the past mm -hmm. that <laughs> when you, when you look at, um, you know, when, when you're looking at origin, you look at uh, Augustine or Augustine, however we want to say it. Um, what is like one of the things that's about them? They're Gentiles. That are that are schooled in Alexandrian thought, in Greco-Roman thought. The men like Ignatius, Irenaeus, Polycarp, while while Gentiles, you know, Polycarp's, you know, interesting 
uh, his history with the Apostle John is I think that Polycarp was a uh, was a slave who ended up being bought by a Christian family who was pastored by John. Mm-hmm. You know, and he ends up pulling out, you know, and coming into, you know, being the, the Bishop of Smyrna, uh, which is likely who the, the angel of the Church of Smyrna is in Revelation is likely Polycarp. Mm-hmm. Um, and what you find, what I find intriguing is that you get those that as they're closer to the apostolic age, as they're closer to there being a preponderance <clears throat> of Jewish, of faithful Jewish believers, those who like um like anna you know who who waited in the temple uh like um uh you know the 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 elderly gentleman that blessed jesus at his uh you know at his mm-hmm. you know after you know at, at his circumcision you know yeah. and the offering there that the closer you are to faithful jewish believers you're going to come away expecting a jewish kingdom you're going mm-hmm. to expect a restoration. I mean, this is the thing that I find amazing. You said, Mark, about, you know, John was a terrible, if he was post-mill, he was a terrible post-mill preacher. <laughs> because, I mean, any anybody that I've ever known that's been post-mill, they are adamant about being hashtagged at post-mill. <laughs> um, you know, let's, let's throw it back on Jesus. When you look to Acts chapter 1, when it says that he was resurrected, when he was resurrected, you know, at his resurrection, he spends, what, 40, 50 days. What does he say that he's teaching on? On the kingdom. That was the content of his preaching. That was the content of that of the greatest seminary that's ever existed, was the kingdom. And just a couple verses later, what did the apostles ask? Is it now that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Mm. Jesus could say... <laughs> Why are y'all so stupid and deaf? You know, I mean, he's, he's, he, I mean, you've heard it said, but I say unto you, he's pretty good at saying that. Are you stiff neck? He doesn't do any of that. What does he say? Mm. Wait, it's not the time yep. yet. Go, ma- go preach the gospel, make disciples. <laughs> and you see, you see Peter's preaching when he says, Hey, the Christ was sent for you. And if you, and he's not talking to a bunch of Greeks, he's talking to a bunch of Jews, and he says, if you would would repent and return, times of refreshing will come. Paul says, you know, that, hey, if it was their rejection of the Messiah was the blessing for the world, what's it going to be when the, when the Jews return to him? Mm-hmm. You know, but life from the dead, you know, and so, um, I mean, I, I praise God for, for, for the salvation from sin. I absolutely do. But the new, if you go back to the Old Testament, you look at, uh, was it Ezekiel 36, Ezekiel 36, Jeremiah 31, and you actually, and if you don't just look at the verses where it talks about, I'm going to give you a new heart which is going to be part of it. But why does God say that he's going to give the new heart? Why he's going to cut a covenant, a new covenant with Israel and Judah? Um, well, because you stunk up the last one. <laughs> you, you broke the last one horribly. And then you're going to now, we're going to, I'm going to give you a new heart so that you'll obey me. And I'm going to give you all the other promises that I, that I am said to give you. Mm-hmm. You know, so, so the, the new covenant is not just spiritual in nature. It's not just a change of heart. It's a fulfillment of all the other stuff, mm. you know, and God bringing to pass what he said he would come to pass. And yeah, so. <laughs> if, uh, I, I mean, if I can I'm say not, something. Go, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> Whereas I, I've, I've kind of always direct my, my, yeah, I do engage with postmen and on-mill people, but I always direct my attention more to dispensational because they're the other pre-mill camp that are different from us. They're the only actually other pre-mill camp that are different from us. And, and I've always um, said, whereas if, if dispens- my dispensational brothers would take, just take the time to kind of study what dispensational come from, you know, John, the father of dispensationalism, John Nelson Darby, to study his life and what everything that he's taught. 
in, in not only that, study the reactions of the churches he was teaching these things in, because no one ever heard of the such teachings of dispensationalism at the time. They were they were they were actually telling him we have never heard such of these things throughout the history of the church. Like we never heard of separation of the the church and Israel and the, you know the Jews. Uh, we 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 never heard of that. They never heard of of rapture being before the tribulation, right? They they have never heard of such things, right? And he would always excommunicate um, whoever would disagree with him, right? And, and I think that's how he maybe got a foothold in in kind of in history of, of him him kind of planting the flag of dispensationalism. Um. So yeah, like I I always encourage my dispensational brothers to kind of really study the history of their the whole the, the dispensational um history yeah yeah and if we got into that a little bit there's a very good video you know contact me sometime there's a great video from dr david martin lloyd jones on the secret rapture the roots of it and if i understand it correctly if i remember it correctly there were these i don't know like Welsh revivals or these revivals going on, Irvingite revivals. And there was a, I think a youth, maybe a teenager that went forward and said, hey, essentially God gave me this private special revelation, pre-trib rapture, basically. We will not be here during the tribulation. Uh, and then historically it goes on from there. Mm -hmm. um, and it that's where it kind of makes it, it's, it's break and it's uh, entrance into church history is what I would argue. Um, so I do want to go to one uh, one of the questions that I um, I sent you all just today, mm. um, and maybe we could just break it down one one uh, one by one. Um, but uh, it says opt optimistic covenantal uh, pre mill view to see Christ moving a great are making a great impact as Matthew 13 speaks about the kingdom being both spiritual and physical presence of Christ. And I think we spoke about that earlier. Um, basically like a, um, a spiritual optimistic view like the, the post mills have, um, but leads to a great apostasy that brings about our blessed hope. Did anybody have a um, feeling on that or, or thoughts about that? What, what I said this, this morning? Hmm. Well, I'll say this. I'm, I'm incredibly optimistic. Uh, I mean, I'm a Calvinist, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, Jesus has a, has a, has a people that he died for. Mm -hmm. he's, going to, he's going to he get all that he bought for. Mm -hmm. all, all that he paid for, he's going to get. So, you know, like, why was there not to be optimistic about that? Uh, I mean, I, I engage in evangelism, you know, quite frequently. And so do I see a lot of people that I, of all the times that I've engaged in evangelism over the years, I could probably count on one hand, maybe on just a couple fingers that the amount of times that somebody was like, I need to believe in Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm super optimistic that the word of God is going to go forth and it's going to do what it is set out to accomplish. And, um, you know, I don't see how, if, if a nation is uh, inundated by the gospel where people uh, as a whole are just overrun with the gospel, that it doesn't actually find itself benefiting where, you know, the societies to where it goes. I mean, it's just kind of a natural conclusion. You know, it's going to be a natural outcome. If there's a ton of Christians and you got, you've got leaders bowing the knee to Jesus, what's going to happen? Things, good things are going to happen. So, you know, you know, I, and, you know, and my, my hope again, and not at this point is not so much the concern of, of, of this present evil age. That isn't to say that I wanted to, to let it go to hell in a handbasket. You know, I, I've been involved. I've been involved in protests for crying out loud, you know, especially around, you know, Corona time um, about, you know, people overstepping their bounds and calling magistrates to repent because there's a king that they've got to bow the knee to. 
but my hope is not that something's going that that right now prior to the return of christ that everything is going to get splendid there are going to be times of that <clears> certainly <throat> but it's jesus's return that's going to be the thing that's mm -hmm. that that it that is the thing that says enough's enough and then then the the knowledge of the lord is going to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea yeah. and to to add on that like like yeah. you just mentioned like people are going to get saved right in the, and and i think on another thing i, I kind of optimistic um I, I i'm assuming we all agree we 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 kind of rejoice with paul the apostle paul when he's speaking in romans 11 when the fullness of gentile comes in there, there, there's going to be a great revival amongst his uh brethren uh, kinsmen in the flesh yeah right and he's letting us know like hey yeah and this is again this dispensationalist we we disagree where we we as a story premium we believe we are within israel right the true israel which is christ and therefore paul is saying hey you gentiles that are grafted in right you are grafted into what israel which is christ don't be prideful and you because there will become a day when the fullness of gentile comes in which is the elect of all the gentiles there will be, uh, you know, paraphrasing the, uh, the a revival amongst the, the natural branches, which is physical Israel, right? The physical descendants of Abraham. Um, and so the, that, that I, I would say that's uh, that's pretty optimistic right before the second coming. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, I, I find the, you know, the optimist. Hey, are we optimistic or pessimistic? I find that very intriguing. You know, in a sense, I'm very pe pessimistic in that, hey, there there are none righteous, no, not one, outside of Jesus Christ. Pessimism for those who are outside of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. um, and for those who are outside of Jesus Christ, the more that you know about God, that he's everywhere, he's all powerful, He's all, he knows everything, you should be very pessimistic today. As long as you are in rebellion to Jesus Christ, there should be nothing but pessimism in your life. But for those who are in Christ, uh, uh, eschatology should fill us with so much optimism. Yeah. Um, as we think about the attributes of God, He is He's omnipotent. He is able to keep all of His promises in Scripture because He's omni omnipotent. Um, he's everywhere. The more that we know about the the attributes of God that should fuel a correct understanding of eschatology. Uh, why? Because end times is linked to the character of God. Just book it, you know. Um, as far as optimism, though, people, you, your post millennials will say that the vast majority of people, or the majority of people, let's say, will be saved and will there will be more people in heaven than in hell. That's generally what your post-millennials would say. Would a historic pre-millennials be able to say that? I think so. I have no qualms with it. I have no objections with it. Charles Spurgeon is a historic pre-millennialist. He, you know, he had no qualms with that. Um, if you count the, the millennial reign of Christ, uh, then absolutely there it seems like there will be way more people saved during the millennial reign of Christ than condemned. Um, and if you take that into account, there'll be, I think there'll be more people in heaven in eternity uh, or, you know, in the new heavens and new earth than, than in hell uh, for sure. Yeah. Um, I think that something you just mentioned there, Mark, about like we, we need to take into account the millennial kingdom, which is what the post mills are doing by, you know, positing it upon this right now uh you know upon upon this age that i mean we think about it if if if, if death is restricted and there is fruitfulness of the womb you know across all nations that the the early the early uh historic pre mill guys were you know the early fathers were accused of being you know super um sensual not not in and i mean sensual not in like a sexual sense but sensual because they were like their grapes are going to be you know the size of basketballs the land is going to just have such growth you know like we've never seen and i again i think it gets back to undoing what adam did and not doing and doing what adam was supposed to do that if when you've got 
you know, what would the world have been like had had Adam not fallen? Think of the, you know, the fruitfulness of the ground right now that we're told that creation cries out for mm. the revealing of the sons of God. Mm. The, the, that, I mean, think, I mean, I, I've, I've driven through Montana. I've lived, I've lived in Idaho and you've got beautiful scenery and you've got the ability to grow, you know, so, some things there. You, you got, you think of uh, the American ground, the, the dirt that we've got and what it's able to produce. What would it be able to produce if the curse was lifted? Right. Right. You know, and yes, I, I believe that is part of, you know, so you go, ba babies are going to be playing around. You're going to have, you know, 800 year old grandpas, <laughs> you know, playing with their great, 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 great grandbabies, you know, like that's optimistic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and you got people, you got nations that didn't know who, you know, that had been in rebellion against Yahweh now aren't, you know, that they're getting all of this stuff, man, that's, that's that. And mm -hmm. as you say, it, it, what is there not to say mm -hmm. about people, you know, be, you know, just people coming left and right being born and, you know, and then being born again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and some of the, maybe you could call it false optimism, or, or whatever you want to call it, is that post millennials would say, hey, we're able to usher in this millennial reign without the return of Jesus Christ. If Maybe you want to call that optimism, but I, I would say no, because of the, the inability of man. We've been trying to usher in the mm -hmm. perfect kingdom for how many thousand years? 6,000 years oh. now. No, only Jesus Christ can usher in this millennial kingdom, this perfect oh. reign that is unlike any other reign, only Preach Jesus it. Christ can do it. And so uh -huh. if, if post millennials want to say it's optimistic to say that, you know, you can do this without Jesus Christ returning. I, I don't think that's optimistic. I just think that's, that's not biblical. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I would say because <laughs> of the, the inability. <laughs> <of> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, because of the inability of man, we, we've proven it for 6,000 years since the fall of Adam. We cannot usher in this millennial perfect reign. Mm. Only Jesus Christ can do it. And, Amen. and it's similar to the first coming of Jesus Christ. People tried to spiritually be made right with God for thousands of years. And mm. during Jesus Christ's first coming, he came, he died on the cross and his perfect righteous life is imputed to us. And he solved the, the dilemma that had been plaguing people for thousands of years. How can we be reconciled with, with God? And it, it's impossible without that first coming of Jesus Christ. And it's going right, to be right, identical. Right. We will not have this perfect millennial reign without Jesus Christ coming. Um, mm. I think I'm convinced that it is impossible. So, yep. And if I can just add some, our good, our good dear brother, uh, Michael uh, Schultz, uh, if I'm pronouncing his last name right. Yes, yes, um, you are. Love that brother. I have heard from him, uh, and that that brother, man. If y'all haven't seen it, go to Eschatology Matters. His the he. I, I always tell him, you 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 have planted the flag of historical pre mill, and you did so with confidence. And and he has been taking a lot of shots from every direction, dispensationalism. Post mill, a mill, you name it. And I, I, I want to mention something that Mark kind of reminded me of, and and I, I'll, I'll kind of be his voice as per se, because <laughs> uh, uh, a lot of people said, "Oh, uh, pre mill guys, a, a lot of pre mills um, are very, you know, have very bad rap throughout church history, you know, and and you know the Munster Rebellion, right? And, and people don't know, and, and uh, the Munster Rebellion in Germany back after the Reformation." Uh, they were the post mill uh, would say, "Oh, they, they were pre mill," but again, uh, God bless Michael Schultz. He he had he did point it out. Actually, if you think about it, they were actually living and acting like post mills because they were trying to usher in the kingdom. They right. Trying, yeah. Right. Like <laughs> pre millennialism oh, yeah. is predicated on one thing: the return of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Like that's it. Like we're not going to get the millennium. 
without the return of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So it, any, and actually, if I don't know, have, have y'all ever read George Peters, um, the theocratic kingdom? If, no. if you do, if you have, I salute you because I've been working through it for like two years. I'm in volume two, <laughs> like, oh, wow. uh, like 200 pages in to the second volume. It's a monster. Uh, but that that's one of the things that he brings out, I think, is with like the Monster Rebellion and, and other things like that. They're like, well, these were pre-mill things. Actually, no, they weren't. Premillennialism is Jesus returns, mm -hmm. then the millennium. Period. We, any Anything where men are trying to force mm. the hand of God is not premillennialism. Amen. And I do want to touch on this because one of the reasons <laughs> I was going to, I was going to ask, I was going to, you want me to read it? What, what, which, which verses? I, yeah. I want to grab, honestly, I want to grab my commentary from, uh, um, Charles Spurgeon on Psalm two. All right. Well, if, uh, well as you're doing, yeah, as, as you're doing that, I'll read, I'll read it. Okay. If you want to, if you want yeah. Um, so Psalm two, um, the, titled the, Lord, the reign of the Lord's anointed. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us burst the bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, You are my son. To get today, I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the earth, the, the ends of the earth, your uh, possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all those who take refuge in him. That's the word of the Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm. You know, I love that a lot of times your post-millennials will point to the royal Psalms um, as proof for post-millennialism. You know, I love that. And uh, you know, but but as I say, I, I don't think that that you got dibs on it, but there's some really big insights on it. Um, Charles Spurgeon writes in this when the first time I read this, I mean it was like getting knocked over the head. Um, I think it, it made a very big impact me. Um, but verses eight and nine ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage. Um, Charles Spurgeon writes, ask me and I will make the nations your herited, uh, inheritance and the ends of the earth, your possession. You will break them with an iron scepter. You will shatter them like pottery. Observe the wonderful contrast between the violent excitement of the Lord's enemies and his psalm and the sublime serenity of God. Uh, he is not disturbed, though the heathen so fur furiously rage and their kings and mighty ones set themselves in battle arrays. He has them in derision. You and I are often downcast and depressed. Uh, and it's going to go on and say, oh, I need to find it. I'll, I'll let you guys. Well, is, so is, yeah. is I will make the nations your heritage and injured. Is, is do post mm -hmm. think? That's giving to the church and all this. Well, it, it, it's it's oh. them believing that all the nations will come to faith in Christ, mm -hmm. um, and you know I I would I would argue that I mean this, this is you know we we look at you know what what was what was understood you know that Israel was Yahweh's inheritance. Mm -hmm. In it say in the same way that just as I Israel was the inheritance of Yahweh, we see that that uh, Christ 
is going to have the nations as his inheritance. Mm -hmm. You know, as the as the son of David ruling over the you know the inheritance of Yahweh, and now it it expands to the whole. And I would say in the same way that Yahweh rules over would rule was ruling over Israel in that same way, in that same light, that you're going to see that the nations are are found to be in possession of being possessed by King Jesus. You know, and, and not merely in a not merely in a spiritual sense, because the Lord didn't re rule and reign over Israel merely spiritually. He ruled over them as a, as an earthly king. And I wish I I could quote Spurgeon like word for word on this. And if I had some time, I could look it up. But he goes into in, in ancient times and biblical times, you had like King Herod, um, who if who danced in front of King Harriet Herod, um, but Herodias' daughter. Yeah, um, and she found favor in in the sight of. King Herod and King Herod essentially says, and he's hyperbolic, he's probably drunk or something, but he says, essentially ask of me and I will give you up to half my, up, what up to half of my kingdom. I think the text says, and the same thing happens in the text with, um, Queen Esther and, and the King there. And Queen Esther finds favor before the King and the King essentially says, ask of me, and I will give you, um, and it will be given unto you. In ancient times, when someone found favor in a king's sight, it was tradition to uh, to grant them a favor, um, to grant them something. And Charles Spurgeon asserts that um, essentially, hey, Jesus Christ does what no man can do. He lives a perfect, sinless life, which no one has ever done. And God the Father says to Jesus Christ, ask of me and I will give you the nations, uh, that kind of thing. Well, where was that fulfilled? Jesus Christ came. He lived the perfect life, never sinned, um, death, burial, resurrection. Um, and I believe that God the Father said that Jesus Christ ask of me and I will give you the nations and Jesus Christ asked for all the nations. Um, and it's connected with his perfect, sinless, righteous life. Um, and that, and we're seeing the "ask me and I will give you the nations." We're seeing that fulfilled as the gospel goes to the nations and it's being preached. And before, you know, before the life of Jesus Christ, you know, believers were largely limited to Israel. Um, and after the life of Jesus Christ, His work you know, it's going to all the nations and we're seeing this being fulfilled, this Psalm two being fulfilled, you know, as we speak, as the gospel goes to all the nations, but you know, why should we not, you know, hold to a post mill view of Psalm two, you shall break them with the rod of iron, you know, essentially it goes on to say, unless you repent, you will perish. Not that all the nations are, you know, are, are converted per se. There's a choice. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, repent yes. or perish, that kind of thing. Um, and so that, that the second part of Psalm two, I think absolutely refutes post-millennialism or it's not consistent with it. Well, also, you know, I, I'm, I'm one to kind of say, okay, I'm reading this in the text. What does this sound like? Do I have somewhere else in the Bible that this sort of thing shows up? You know, is, is there anywhere else? With scripture. You know, that we look at in Revelation 19, and we see in ver beginning in verse 11, that I saw heaven open up and I hold a white horse, and he who sits on it is called faithful and true, and in righteousness is judges and wages war. And then we... I go down to 15 and said, and from his mouth comes a sharp sword so that he may strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the wine press of the wrath of the rage of God, the almighty. And he has on his garment on and on his thigh a name written of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And that you see, I, I would venture to say that if you look at Psalm two, you compare that with then also revelation 19, mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. beginning of, um, and then also Daniel seven, because Daniel seven talks about one like a you know the cloud rider coming up to the sun, you know to the ancient of days, one who's like a son of man, and it says to him that to him was given a dominion, glory, and kingdom. And how would have Daniel? How would have anybody have read a glory, kingdom, and a dominion that all the people's nations? And men of every tongue might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not be taken away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. And you put all that together, I'd say that Psalm 2 not only does it have some application to, hey, bow the knee now, mm-hmm. but he explicitly, you know, we see that Yahweh explicitly says in verse 6, but as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. What is, where is Zion? Jerusalem. And that here you have, boom, that this is not just, a, this is not me, it isn't only over the heart. It is a promise that his king will rule from Zion over the nations, that he will, you know, that all the ends of the earth will be his possession. He will break them with a rod of iron. He will shatter them like a potter's vessel. Mm-hmm. You will have the nations that will come up against him in rage against him as he's returning and what's he going to do it's going to crush him and why and the lord laughs he goes i've installed my king on zion buddy yeah yeah hey guys i I do have to run um thank you guys for having me on it's been so much fun yeah and if you guys do have a part two keep me in touch man absolutely (laughs) god bless all you guys lord bless you thank you brother well and in Psalm 2, you know, it starts out with the nations raging against God and plotting right. against God. And towards the end of the psalm, now counsel is given to these kings, these rulers, these leaders, nations who are in rebellion against God. Counsel is given to them. And it says, now, therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling, kiss the sun. Uh, essentially, unless you repent, you will perish. Uh, right. To to these folks, and and you know, I, I think it spans the course of history. Uh, rulers and nations and leaders have have dealt with this throughout history. Unless you repent, you shall perish, uh, right. as well. So, right. And and I and I'd say that this is it's predicated upon that future coming day. When I mean, this is one of I, I, something I recently read that I, I found intriguing. I can't. I've read so much recently; it's it's absurd. As I said in the message earlier uh, earlier last week, Daryl, about you know when you're when you're away from the pulpit for three years, you get to chase your hobby horses. <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, you know, so I've taken advantage of it. But one of the things that I've recently read or heard that apparently. I don't know if it was Diocletian or it was just, it was one of the Roman emperors who uh, took the Jewish expectation of a coming king from the line of David so seriously that what he would do is he would hunt down descendants of David and kill him. And so then when you have the Christians come in, and I'm like, guess what? The descendant of David has come. And so the, the us going in and saying mm-hmm. Jesus is Lord is not just merely a is a, it's not just merely a spiritual or salvific thing. It is a wildly political statement, especially when you know Rome is like, no, you got to say Caesar is Lord. No, 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 nobody. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is King. And so. You know, and one of the things that the uh, early church fathers would argue would be like, hey, you don't have to worry about us as Christians. We're not going to overthrow you. Jesus will. <laughs> you know, you know, that that's that's not for us to do. Our, ours is to serve you and to obey you because uh, Jesus, our king, has set you over us. You don't have to worry about us. We're going to be good citizens. But it's Jesus that you have to worry about. Oh, nations, oh, kings kiss the sun because he's going to come back 
Um, I mean, that that's, I mean, why do you see, you know, so much persecution on the part of uh, the, you know, the tyrants of this world even now? You look at Nor North Korea and why do they rage against Christians? It's because we serve a different king. And, and we're not looking to overthrow anybody. Mm -hmm. But because we don't have some, you know, we have a we have somebody above them that can't handle it, and they don't they don't like the idea that one day they're going to have to actually give an account to this guy, you know, to a Jew in Jerusalem, you know, let alone the 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 final judgment. And you know, one of the arguments in this book, you know, is yeah. that. Early believers, why didn't early believers talk even more about premillennialism? And one of the arguments is, well, you're under Roman rule. And when you do this, you talk about this, this reign, coming reign of Christ. Um, you, you're worried about your life. You're worried about persecution. Right. And that's why that explains uh, part of it as well. Right. So, right. Especially if we put ourselves in their shoes, you know, if we came under that reality here in, in America today, where you're talking about this reign of Christ and it could cost you your life because those in power see it as a threat. Um, perhaps they're, you know, you'd have to think about that as well. So, right. Well, well is there something that I, I don't know, I'd seen where, you know, it's, it's less of a threat to believe if you're a tyrant it is less of a threat to believe that that this ruling and reigning messiah is his reign is merely spiritual is exclusively spiritual because hey yeah. i you know i i'm i'm good I, as long as you know i i give some you know maybe i pitch a little incense to this god it's a different thing when you say actually it's he, he will come again. He he does he is intending to overthrow you, you know, and replace you with his governors. Um, you know that becomes a you know and and well who are those people going to be? Oh yes, yeah, those it's those bums on the street that you keep kicking and lighting on fire. They're the ones that are going to be set up over you, dude. Um, you know it's it's intrig. You know, it's just. You know, and maybe one of the reasons why you don't really write so much. I mean, you're you're being burnt at the stake. You know, you're being used as lamps. It's kind of hard to write when you're been doused with oil. Um, you know, or being you know used for uh, the the food of the lions um, or gladiatorial bait. Um, it's kind of hard to write when when you're doing that, and and yet what. Is it enough? And I say, is it enough to to have had the the scriptures, uh, in, you know, of the prophets that tell you certain things, that say certain things? To um, yeah, you know, is is was the scripture you know is the scripture of the prophets enough to say, you know, that hey, it, it speaks for itself that you can expect a coming kingdom of the Messiah on the earth. And I think I, I, I make, I argue that yes, I, I, it is. So even if, you know, there wasn't, there isn't that much written, well, it's because why do you need to rewrite what 39 books of the Old Testament have already said? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, I mean, I, I, I take a pretty, you know, I, I, I if if it was enough for the Bereans to be able to hold their you know Old Testament in hand, you know however you know they roll out the scrolls, you know however they did that, if to for the Bereans to Bible check uh, Paul, um, the the Old Testament should be sufficient enough for us to be able to cl plainly and clearly read it and say, okay, w what's being fed to me? Is this what this what these texts say? Because the apostles aren't going to say anything that contradicts or, you know, isn't plainly written by the prophets, you know, and written, you know, and expected by Moses. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's, there, it's just, so, 
that's I, I I could I love the I, I love this topic uh, quite a bit because especially being the you know Reformed Baptist there's I feel like I'm the uh, oddball out you know you get some uh, you're not reformed enough because you're a premillennialist and for others you're too reformed because you're a Calvinist you know <laughs> so, yeah yep I could see that yeah you know and so being able to to talk on this is because I I appreciate Mike Schultz you know as um, Elias has said that, you know, basically Mike's planting that flag out there. Um, and that's why I'm even here is because of, because of Mike and his, his suggestions. Mm-hmm. So I, I appreciate him like more than, you know, and being able to kind of raise that flag again to say, wait, hold on. What is the Bible actually saying? And if we just read it, what would we come away with? How could we, what would we walk away with? And I, I don't think that you could walk away honest, you know, if you're honestly not, if you, if you spent most of your time in your Bible reading throughout a year in the old Testament, which is what I end up doing. Like th- two thirds of my year is in the old Testament. But if you spend that much time in the mm-hmm. old Testament, you're mm-hmm. going to come into the new Testament with an entirely different perspective than if you spent your time reading Calvin and Augustine, um, yeah. you know, and, and I think it was uh, Schultz that even said that, you know, so it's, it's not, it, yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's that I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm rambling at this moment. So yeah, well, you know, we agree in that when I pick up my Bible, you know, oftentimes, Hey, new, Old Testament. We're going there right now. I'm reading through Ecclesiastes, which is you know a phenomenal book, um, f- just full of insight on living a purposeful life and everything right. uh, for God's glory. Um, yeah. But uh, you know, if we talk a moment about a nickname for historic premillennialism, would be you know. Pre- Post trib, pre mill, yeah. uh, we could say, and even amongst all millennials, you know, they'll disagree on some things. There'll be different perspectives on some things. Same thing with post millennialism. Mm-hmm. You know, I think the same thing will be would hold true with historic pre mill on the nature of tribulation before Christ's coming. Mm-hmm. Um, you know. If you had if you had the historic pre mill timeline, there'd be a tribulation or or great tribulation, you could argue, then the second coming of Jesus Christ, um, and you could hold it with the view of, I guess, call it more of a vanilla view, I guess, where there hey, there's just tribulation until Jesus Christ returns, or you right. could hold it with a view of no there there's this great tribulation right. um futuristic view of mm-hmm. revelation um and then jesus christ returns if i understand correctly um right. do you have any thoughts on that by chance or yeah so something i've recently i mean i think that one you have a kind of a more historicist approach which was i think that might be john gill john gill i think was more historicist hey daryl's back uh mm-hmm. Uh, they, but, um, you know, the historicist, I, I think, I think is more going to be more apt to say that there's going to be, um, you know, which, you know, I, I'll let the cat out of the back. I'm a futurist, you know, in this, but I do believe that there's going, that there's going to be tribulation, you know, up until the time of the, you know, the final period right before Jesus returns, because I think that's what the scriptures say. Um, and that, you know, historicists may say that, well, and I, I really don't want to like misconstrue that view there, but that, yeah, yeah, there's, you know, there's going to be tribulation. We're living in tribulation and, um, it'll carry on until Jesus returns. I, I can affirm that. Um, I mean, we got, bro- we have like, you know, we've had the benefit as brothers here in the U S to, to have had a two hour conversation about, you know, something that hasn't happened yet while we've got 
brothers, we got brethren in the rest of the world that right now are, you know, experiencing unspeakable evils because of, you know, them naming the name of Christ, um, to which, you know, Jesus is going to more than make up for what they've suffered. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, and I, and I, what, a, what, a, what a thing it will be that when these tyrants, if they continue to re refuse to kiss the sun, what, what a look would it be? And this is part of the reason why I'm uh, partly another reason I, I consider premillennialism logically is the nation, the, the world has not had a perfect government yet. It's never seen it. It's never seen what a king, a good king actually really was. And it needs one. The world needs a good king. It needs a good emperor. And that's only found in Jesus. And what a look, what, what a face it'll be for those tyrants that have, that have murdered God's people for so long. And then look and go, wait, I off that guy and he's ruling over me, mm. you know, mm. you know, um, but yeah, so. So I, I think that there is, you know, potentially, you know, th this room for uh, obviously because you know John Gill was historicist. Um, I I I get the feeling maybe Spurgeon might have been historicist, might have been futurist. I don't know. I I believe I've heard <laughs> that Spurgeon was historicist as well, and and I understand that as believing that the Book of Revelation is unfolding throughout human right. history throughout these right. you know right uh, the church age i guess you'd call it yeah um, no. which used to be very popular mm -hmm. back in the day but mm -hmm. but not very popular now almost i extinct now or endangered you know pretty unpopular yeah. now i think yeah and i one thing that i I've, i found i forget who it was that one of the early church fathers i mean it's it, it they basically believed that there would be a time where we would see the Antichrist revealed and that we would suffer horrible, horrible things um, up until the time of Jesus' return, that there would come that time that the Antichrist... I mean, that, that's, that's what Paul says in, what, First Thessalonians? You know, that the man of lawlessness will be revealed. You know, you know he's going to be revealed and we're going to in, endure unspeakable evils um, such as never have been before. And, you know, just as, um, you know, the world is you know, getting as dark as it possibly can, what's going to happen, the sun's going to go dark, the moon's going to turn to blood, this, you know, the stars are going to fall from the heavens, and the people, instead of repenting, they're going to go, oh, mountains and rocks hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. And, you know, like, how about you just repent? Right. <laughs> like, just repent. You know, it ain't, he, you know, you ain't dead yet. Um, so, you know, that, so that, that's, you know, that, that, that's, that's that, um, I was, I was looking for, there was actually something that was kind of interesting it, that it, something you said, Mark, that kind of had me going here was, um, something about why we aren't necessarily really, I think it might've been from Peter's that it said. Uh, something to the effect that we can't necessarily really be in the kingdom yet, that the church can't be the kingdom that was promised, because look at all the different church government. You know, look at, you know, you know, I, I'm a Baptist, so I'm a Congregationalist by nature. Um, you know, Daryl, you're Presbyterian, so that's a, that's yeah. a different polity within within the church. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know how yours works, Mark, uh, but... <laughs> You know, so, but, you know, you, you have, but you have those basic forms of, you know, the, of Presbyterianism, the, the Presbyterian model, you have the uh, Episcopalian model uh, of a bishop, rule, you know, over everything. And then you have the congregational model, which, you know, that, that is varies from congregation to congregation. And that mm -hmm. if we're in the kingdom, why is the kingdom so poorly ran? Why don't we know how to actually function governmentally? You know, mm. why are we having those battles unless we're not the kingdom and well, we're waiting the kingdom? And oftentimes, you know, our, our post mill 
millennial brothers and sisters will just give it some time give it a hundred more years or without you know so many more years right. and and then we'll get it right we'll get church governance right we'll get you know nations right with them serving christ and everything um right yeah and yeah, and i and i just i'm sorry i can't see that from the scriptures i would like to i i would and you know some of their arguments would be hey if you look today there's more believers today than there's ever been um and they would oftentimes make the argument of two steps forward one step back just give it enough time uh you know that kind of thing right and and another one um the the parable of the mustard seed and so it's a gradual growing of the kingdom and you know being historic pre-mill i have no no qualms with uh, with a triumphant church, with a militant church, with um, a church that, hey, you know, during the time of Noah, there was arguably, what, eight believers on Noah's Ark. And today there's how many millions of believers right, putting their faith in Jesus Christ. And so, you know, obviously uh, Christ's kingdom is growing. He's building his church. He's building right. his kingdom today. So, right. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and so I don't, I don't have like, Jesus has an elect people that he died for and he's going to rescue them from their sin. He's no. going, it's going to happen. Sorry. So, you know, and, and he's, he's, he's worthy of, of a multitude uh, that, you know, that cannot be counted. Um, so, you know, I don't think post mills got, got that position on lockdown, you know, <laughs> you know, so, um, and I've got I've got all mill post and post mill friends that I, I love dearly, and I love having these discussions. Um, you know, even if they're wrong, um, mm -hmm. well, <laughs> which, which I'm wrong to them too. So, uh huh. One other thing that that grabs my attention, grabs my mind, is you know I don't believe God is a a, a communist or a socialist. I don't think everyone has the same exact reward in. No. Uh, in the millennial kingdom or you know, in heaven. Um, you know, there will be people, believers. First, let me say, we're all saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. There's nothing that we can do to earn our salvation or to contribute to our uh, salvation. Yet, when we read scripture, not everyone is rewarded, I would argue, equally in eternity and not everyone is punished equally in eternity there are those who are storing up the wrath of god um you know and god said hey vengeance is mine i will repay i believe every sin in the history of the universe will be will be punished and it will either be punished and pardoned in christ um or it will be punished and pardoned or punished in the age to come right. uh, but but God not only punishes, you know, what does a government do? A government rewards those who do good right. and punishes those who do evil. Yeah. And that's what we can expect in uh, in the future is that Jesus Christ will set up his kingdom. He will reward uh, believers and he will punish evildoers. And not everyone's reward in eternity will be uh, will be the same. Uh, there will right. be, you know, preterists would, would argue with this. They'd have a big beef with this, but there will be those who will be put in charge of five cities or or 10 cities, so to speak, mm -hmm. is my right. belief on the matter. There are those who will right. be put in charge more or given more responsibility or more reward in, right. uh, you know, during the millennial reign. Right. So, I, I, Well, that's what Jesus says. Like, mm -hmm. You know, there is going to be, you know that sort of you know that governance i mean we we've we've been promised that we're going to you know the, the apostles were told that they were going to um in the kingdom going to rule over the 12 tribes of israel you know they're going to sit on thrones over the 12 tribes of israel and that's a pretty high lofty thing i mean they're the apostles they they should get that <laughs> you know um you know if if I if I've got if I've got like one little corner of a slum, I'll I'll gladly take that. 
but even the slum in the kingdom would be good. Amen. Um, Amen. I, I, yeah. just, I was just about to say that. But bro brothers, yeah. I do have to drop. I appreciate the conversation. Yeah. We definitely have to have a part two. I'm, I'm going to be watching, though. Yeah. All right. okay. Lord bless you, Terrell. Mm -hmm. You too, brother. Um, but that, you know, there's a, you know, it's, I mean, we, we look at when Jesus, you know, when he's saying, he says to, to, to Tyre, you know, and Sidon, you know, like, hey, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah, I think it's hard as, you know, they'll, they're going to rise up against you guys in the, you know, in, in the judgment. You know, had they been given the light that you had, mm -hmm. they would have been better off. It's going to be worse off for you. It will be, yeah, more tolerable for them, Sodom and right. Gomorrah, the most wicked civilization on earth, than for those who had come face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ, heard, right. heard essentially the gospel from the Lord Jesus Christ and refused to repent, refused to believe, refused to listen. Right. It's going to be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than for right. them. And so I, I believe that shows a degree of, right. of more punishment for them. Yeah. Right, right. And, and, you know, it would be because, you know, the, the judge of all the earth will do right. Um, it would be unreasonable and unjust for you know an adolf hitler you know we can throw him under the bus for obvious mm -hmm. reasons you know for him to be punished at an equal rate as you know let's say you know just some joe schmo you know normal run-of-the-mill sort of center mm -hmm. um and it would it would be it would be unjust for a, a wicked false teacher, for a Benny Hinn, for instance, mm -hmm. who is preaching a false gospel, has led millions of people astray um, to not believe in the in the biblical gospel, for him to not receive a greater judgment than again, you know, the person he led astray. Mm -hmm. The person he led astray is certainly going to be judged, but but somebody like a hen or, you know, Joel Osteen or any other false teacher is worthy of so much more judgment because of what they've done. You know, whatever God is, you know, and God, God's going to meet those things out. And in, in the relation to even the millennial kingdom is again, looking at and saying that God has made promises that he intends to keep that you can plainly read that just as he plainly told us that a messiah would come and that he would that he plainly would be crushed and endure the wrath of god that in those same passages that you you get what when jesus says you know hey that you know this you know this has been fulfilled in your ear you know when he, when he reads out of isaiah and you're like hey I've come to open the eyes of the blind and all of that stuff. And then the other half of it is, you know, his, his second coming. He intends to keep all of this stuff plain, you know, like you can plainly read it and go, oh, okay. Yeah. He, he, he did it just like he said he would do it here. Why is it that it changes at his second coming that there becomes a, a different weight and measure of interpretation? Why is it that these, that these things meant, a an actual you know both physical and spiritual things but then when you start looking at the other stuff it doesn't mean that why is it that uh particularly like i look another one that i think of is like isaiah 11. um like this is one of the things that gets me is, is isaiah 11 and when we're told this um uh, about the the branch you know this righteous branch coming you know from the stem of jesse and all of this stuff and it goes into verse six and it says, and the wolf, you know, will, will dwell with the lamb mm -hmm. and the leopard will lie down with the young goat and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a young boy will lead them. Also the cow and the bear will graze. Their young will lie down together and the lion will eat straw like the ox and the nursing baby. Okay. These you've got a young boy and a nursing baby will play by the hole of the cobra and the weaned child will uh, put his hand on the viper stand. I've got all three of these levels in my household, you know, wean child babies and, uh, you know, young children. Um, it says they will do no evil. 
nor act corruptly in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. This obviously has to do with something with Jesus. I have yet to see this happen. This does not appear in any way that this has to that this relates to the eternal state, because you've got nursing ch children, you got a, you got a baby, you have a nursing baby, you have a wean child, and a young boy. These are those are. That's not the eternal state. This is something other. And you cannot tell me, oh, that this is in the church right now, that the wolf is right now dwelling with the lamb, because that you, you gotta it, you gotta adhere to that spiritually. You look at that spiritually and go, those people who were once really bad people, and then those really timid and meek people are able to come together and uh, dwell together in the church. That leopards and young goats. Well, again, you you have these the the meat eaters in the the meat are somehow you know christians now being able to work together like mm -hmm. i i'm sorry I, well, how, how, how about we just look for the day as i jokingly say i'm looking forward to the day even though i won't need an emotional support animal i look for the, forward to the day when i've got a 30 foot 30 foot alligator as my emotional support gator you know you know uh -huh. and then i that I've got a lion for my house cat and I'm able to sit there and scratch underneath its mane, you know, it's beautiful bearded mane mm -hmm. and not have to worry about being eaten. And it was the, it was the belief of the faithful Jews in the early church that they would look at something like this and go, you know what? The produce of the land is going to be so good that they're not going to need to eat meat. That the that the grapes will be so satisfying, the the the, the fruit of the land is going to be so satisfying that cobras are going to be you know play noodles. You know, like please, that that looks that to me is so it's so good, and then that's that's just that's just the you know, the appetizer to what's to come in the eternal state. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's, it's going to be great and get greater it, and just keep getting better and better and better. And, you know, it's something that we should, that we ought to be thinking about for sure. Right. Um, because, it, you know, it can fuel our Christian walk and, yeah. uh, and all that too. And you alluded to it earlier in that the early church was comprised of, of, more, of more Jewish believers of more, Believers who were literate on the Old Testament, they were uh, more familiar with it than when you get later into church history and arguably your Gentile believers come in and they're they're less familiar with the Old Testament, may, arguably less literate with the with the Old Testament. And, you know, I would just argue that those believers who were familiar with the Old Testament mm -hmm. Uh, in the early church were historic pre-mill as well. And, and exactly. understood. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I completely agree. I, because again, as I read that quote from Bettner, you know, Lorraine Bettner said, Hey, if you take this literally, you absolutely are going to be a premillennialist. Okay. I guess I take, I read my Bible literally. Shoot me. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll gladly, I will gladly take up that mantle. Um, that I read my Bible literally. And one of the, I would say even one of the benefits of, you know, some of the things about being historic pre-mill, you know, is there is still some weight for us to be able to say, I don't quite understand this. You know, I don't quite understand how this is all going to play out. I got the big picture. Like that for me is what I, I find to be most important is trying to get the big picture as opposed to the minutia and having all my charts and, you know, graphs and, you know, when, when's the seventh trumpet and when's the, the seal judgments. And I don't quite understand all of that, but what I understand is Jesus is going to come back and set up a kingdom. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the book of revelation, the, the all of it discourse really um, I have such a hard time with, because I'm, I don't like any one view on it, to be honest. I mean, right. um, preter, partial preterists have some really, good points i think 
um, points that, you know, sometimes keep me up at night. And, you know, a response to partial preterism would be dual fulfillment. It, there was a fulfillment mm -hmm. back then, mm -hmm. and then there's a future fulfillment yep. as well. Yep. You know, I like that, but I think there's some problems with it as well. Um, yeah. particularly where the verse in scripture that says, you know, such as never has been, nor, nor ever shall be, I'm, I'm probably butchering it. But <laughs> right. If I, you're familiar with that verse, right? Yeah. Yeah. That would, that would limit a dual fulfillment on some of those things. Right. Well, and that's, you know, and so there's, you know, I want to say it's, um, if you look at, like first that's so i think it's i saw something recently i'll have to maybe i'll send it to you directly is that um like a comparison of like first thessalonians 4 and 5 in matthew 24 and when g and this is this is kind of in relation to dispensationalist premillennialism um that they go well matthew 24 has nothing to do with the rapture which you know paul then says you know hey i got you know I, this is from the word of the lord and then you look at how he's got it playing out, and it's like, well, no, actually, that's Matthew 24 right there, like boom, 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 boom. Um, and it plays out to where, you know, as the for, towards, you know, in favor of the the post trip position, the the historic pre mill position. Um, you know, and I say that I think that there is, now getting back to the idea of dual fulfillment, I think that there is room. So this is kind of how I you know look at it is you know some cyclical type stuff, you know is you're seeing that that God is raising up and tearing down things to give us a sense of okay just as just as in the Old Testament there were types and shadows that pointed us to Jesus, um, be it like Leviticus 16 in the Day of Atonement you look at the Passover you look at all this stuff. Um, that you couldn't just throw out one person to completely fulfill to show what what this Messiah would do. You had to have all of this stuff so that when that one person came around, you were like, "That's the guy I've been waiting on." And likewise, that you know, with with certain, you know, especially with with the future, with what is to come, that you see look at what the Romans did to, to Jerusalem. You look and see what Antiochus Epiphanes had done, you know, to the temple, you know, you, like you get all of this stuff and you're like, man, that's really bad, but that doesn't appear to be quite, quite what this is talking about. Like it, it, it's got the flavor of it, but not quite there yet. You know, the, because there's something more that, when the time hits, you're going to go, oh, 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 that, that's it. That's it. That's what I, that's what we were reading because this is hitting, you know, this is hitting on all cylinders. Um, not just a little bit here and not just a little bit there. Um, if that makes any sense and answers, answers what you were saying at all. Yeah. Well, you know, let me go to, it's Matthew 24, 14. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, reformers will read this. This good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Mm -hmm. And many reformers can make a very convincing case that this, this was fulfilled. It's already been fulfilled in the past. Right. Um, they can make that argument and it's, it's actually a very convincing argument. And yet, if you flip the page to Matthew 25, you have the, the parable of, well, it gets into the sheep and the goats mm -hmm. and you have Jesus Christ judging all the nations. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I just remain unconvinced that Matthew 24, 14, that's all in the past. There's no, no future. Right. And, and even post millennials would say, well, yes, there are future implications on that. Um, but, but it's not in this verse whatsoever is what they would say. We can get it from other texts of scripture. 
Um, because because par partial preterists would say this was fulfilled within within even Paul's lifetime. The gospel went to all the nations, and he'll write how the gospel has went to all the nations, even in his, in his right. lifetime. Right, so. right, and you know, so I'm just kind of thinking off the cuff here with with that is that you know you kind of see how Jesus is is speaking, and you know, then the end will come. You know, therefore, you know when you see the abomination of desolation, which is spoken of through Daniel, the prophet, um, that, you know, that there is coming a time, you know, the question is, is, is the end, the immediate end? Like, is it the end of, of all things or is it, you know, by this, I mean, like, is it you know, like, Hey, the ends come because the gospel has now been proclaimed to all the nations, uh, which I, I take to, what how that's going to be accomplished is not me, not just through um the north american mission board of the southern baptist convention or you know any other mission sending agency um but you know that there will be the you know not only the 144,000 Jews but also we're we're told of how there's going to be angels in the heavens you know proclaiming the gospel all the nations are going to hear it and that when it's all there and it's all done uh, and you've endured uh, to the end, you're going to be saved. And that you kind of, I guess what I'm saying is like verse 14 almost kind of has like a, like here, I'm just going to give you like the, the, the general synopsis, like the, the straight up, like let's, let's speedily get through it. And then I'm going to explain, you know, I'm going to explain it a little bit more if that makes you know, mm -hmm. any, any sense is that you, you've got, okay, let me give you this, this general idea. Now, let me give you some more specifics. Let me give you, you know, you know, some things, you know, that you're going to see. Um, because uh, what I, there is, if, I forget who it was, the, um, it's an early, early, the early church fathers, it actually might've been Ir Irenaeus, you know, that took the position, you know, certainly took the position that Matthew 24 was future. That it wasn't a 70 AD thing. Um, and then when he also talked about um, the mark of the beast and, you know, the 666 and all that stuff, he actually outright says, you know, I, I believe it's like, you know, talks about, yeah, okay, this, this isn't about Nero. You know, it goes back even to then. They're like, we will know his name because God has given it ahead of time, but this guy hasn't come yet. Um, and, you know, it's one of those things where you go, these guys were this close to the apostles and they're telling me, hold my horses. Don't think that everything has already been taken, has already taken place. Um, you know, we can sense that, yeah, that there, that there has been some, some fulfillment, some, some flavoring of it, but not quite, not quite all that, you know, all of it's been, it hasn't, you get the preview of it, but you didn't get the whole movie. Mm -hmm is you know that, that's kind of my that's kind of how i'm you know go through because i'll be honest 20 matthew 24 i'm like okay how do i you know how do you work through this uh, yeah. i've preached on that i've even preached on matthew 24 and like there is i think to some extent something in this some way somehow that there was at least some semblance of it was pointing to uh what you know we were we saw a, a shadow of of what's to come in 70 AD. Um, but, you know, the kind of the question is, what is the sign? You know, what's the sign of the son of man? Um, you know, like, what is it? You know, is it a, is it a cross in the sky that says, you know, in this sign conquer, you know, <laughs> you know, what is it? Um, I've heard somebody recently argue, argue and I'm like, that's pretty intriguing is that it's him coming in the clouds that it like, and not just that, it's it's actually more of a, it looks more like the cloud that had descended on Mount Sinai. And that that's what the Jews are going to look at and go, that's the cloud rider. That's Yahweh. Wait, is that a man? Oh, no, that's Jesus. You know, sort of a thing. Um, it, I, that's me rambling now. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, we could, you know, dive into this a lot you know and explore maybe the different views on you yeah. know matthew 24 generally your 
po- modern post millennialists would be partial preterists on this, mm-hmm. um, and and on millennials as well. Some you yeah. know pre- split on that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then you know there's those who who would say not not everything, but some of it there's dual fulfillment going on yeah. where some was fulfilled in the in the past and some will be yeah. in the present. And we have we can point to examples of dual fulfillment right. um, with again the virgin shall be with child. Right. Um, and that was fulfilled within that prophecies uh, that prophet's lifetime. Yep. Um, yep. But the ultimate fulfillment was Jesus Christ. Exactly. Um, out of my out of Egypt, I brought you know I brought out my son. Well, hey, the Israelites. God brought the Israelites out of Egypt. Um, he also brought the, Jesus Christ out of Egypt as well. There's arguably a, a dual fulfillment there as well. Some right. people would point to a, a dual fulfillment here as well. You know, and I, I go back and forth because I mean. Partial preterists, I mean, Matthew Henry and company, they make a, a convincing case as well. But, uh, you know, with that, we'll try to just draw things to a close. Do you have any final no. thoughts? Um, no. Um, well, I, I appreciate both, you know, you, you and Daryl having me on again. I I mean, I counted a, a, a very... Um, I can't, I really do count it a, an honor to be back on. Um, it, it's, it's a blast for me. I, like I, I don't, I'm not in any way, shape or form trying to build any sort of uh, <laughs> empire of uh, you know, social media empire of any, it, you know, anything like that. I'm just, I'm just a guy um, who reads too much. Um, <laughs> so it's um it's, it's been a blast, you know, to be back on again. And if you guys would have me, I'd love to be on again. Um, me, you know, maybe this side of the kingdom will actually, maybe sometime we'll meet. Um, maybe a better chance with uh, Daryl being in Virginia. Uh, unless you plan on, co- if you ever come by Florida, seriously, just let me know. I'd love, well, you know. A, yeah, I've been to Florida a couple times. Yeah. So, so if you ever come into central Florida, mm-hmm. you seriously give me a holler. We'll, you know, I'd love to have you meet my family. So, um, but yeah, that as a final thought, you know, what I'd say is um, first and foremost, historic premillennialism is not dispensational premillennialism. So stop lumping us together. Uh, you know, please. Well, um, and a lot of times when others will uh, be, because dispensational premillennialism is the predominant view within American yeah. evangelicalism. Right. Um, so a lot of times when post millennials or amillennials will critique premillennialism, it's always dispensational right. premillennialism. Right. It seems like, um, right. but but I think it's fair to say historic premill gets rid of a lot of the problems yeah. that dispensational premillennialism has. Yeah. It does. So. Uh, it, it does, and. I think it also, you know, is the, you know, when that chart that Daryl had up earlier, I find a, that that uh, pie graph, not the pie graph, the um, Venn diagram, I guess. The Venn right? diagram chart, yeah, yeah. was is, is, is incredibly helpful because what I to be able to look at and say, okay, that there is the the correlation between post mill and pre mill is that we don't believe in that it's just a spiritual reign, but there is that there are material implications uh, to the kingdom. We also believe that with the ah mills that, you know, the world is not necessarily going, you know, generally speaking, isn't going to be, you know, puppy dogs and rainbows at the time of Jesus's returns. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and the, what you see is the one holdup that, 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 that really in my mind that post mill and ah mill are doing they want to distance themselves from the the, uh, the premillennial underpinning of both of their views is because for some reason we can't look at and see that Jesus is that it's necessary for Jesus to return for for all of these things to be accomplished that we assume 
that those positions assume that it that what can be accomplished can be accomplished um, by the proclamation of the gospel. When the proclamation of the gospel is to prepare those who would inherit the coming kingdom to get to get people ready because the kingdom is coming and you need you need to be ready um we don't know when that's going to be but the kingdom is coming um and you know anybody out there you know you know maybe leave it on this is that anybody that is that does not know the lord jesus christ that catches you know that's for some reason somehow sat through two hours almost three hours of this um that you sit through this and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, know that the, the king rules and reigns right now and he is coming back. You will have to give an account to him. You do not want to be found um, on the wrong side of his judgment seat. You, you want to be accounted an inheritor of his promises. So please, please bow the knee to your king today because Jesus is Lord. And kiss the sun, lest he be angry. And as you were saying before, I mean, post-millennialism has this optimism where Jesus Christ returns in what's going on. It's the brightest days of mankind. Oh, yeah. Whereas yeah. all millennialism and historic premillennialism generally are united saying, no, it's not the brightest days of mankind that Jesus right. returns to. It, there, there's great darkness going on right. uh, at this time. There's, there's a great falling away going on as well. Right. Um, and so, when you think about that, you know, that's I find that to be incredibly mind-boggling. When Jesus Christ returns, is it to the brightest days of mankind, or to arguably the, the darkest days of man? You know, right. mankind. Um, or that there could be a, a third view and it's just as it's always been kind of thing. Not, not, not dark, but not bright, if that makes sense. Right. Right. You know, yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll take the, that it looks like when he returns, it's going to be terrible when he first steps down. But when, what, what, when he's ruling and reigning, no eye has seen, no ear has heard what God, ha, you know, has promised His people. Like what He has in mind for His people, and what He has in mind for this world uh, before the eternal state is going to be wonderful. It's going to be seriously wonderful. Um, I, I look forward to the day when I don't, I no longer look at a, a snake and call it a nope rope. You know, <laughs> you know, or you know, seeing. That, that things like that aren't going to be anymore, that it'll be back. It'll be better than what Eden was. And then, then the eternal state will be better than the millennium. Mm -hmm. You know, it's going to be uh, like all, all in all, I guess my biggest thing is I, I just want to see Jesus. <laughs> I just want to see him. I want to see the one who paid my debt. I want to, I want to see my King because he's a King worth dying for. He's a king worth fighting for. And even if we disagree on, you know, our eschatological differences, you know, he, he's a king worth serving. And I, I pray that we can all, uh, we can serve him um, in faithfulness and truth. And, uh, you know, when we when we go into the kingdom that the uh, mills and post mills will say, sorry, I you misunderstood that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, well, you know, uh, and if there's any any scene from scripture where you'd say, "Hey, I want to be there. I wish I could see it," you know, number one on people's minds might be the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, yeah. um, or or maybe the ascension, maybe maybe the flood, maybe creation itself. Arguably, I, I think the return of Jesus Christ yeah. should be at the very top of that list, maybe number one on the list. Um, yeah. If you're watching the crucifixion, you'll just be bawling your eyes out, I would think. Um, no. But the resurrection that might instill that, uh, tons of joy. But the the return of Jesus Christ, the, arguably, 
number one on the list. And and wow. what will the return of Jesus Christ be like? Uh, it, it's something that, you know, as believers, hey, with, with our kids, with the next generation, l- less time video games, less time thinking about lesser things, more time thinking about the return right. of Jesus Christ right. and the implications of it. Um, a long time ago, I was listening to a sermon from Steve Lawson, and, and he would be more progressive dispensational, um, but he was talking about the return of Jesus Christ, arguing that Jesus Christ returns, and, and before his return, you have, uh, hey, the sun is blotted out. Um, and, and so what is there? There's this pitch black darkness going on. Um, is God's pouring out judgment and his wrath and it's terrifying people where the the sun's blotted out. It's midnight darkness. Uh, That'd be just terrifying. Well, then what happens? Jesus Christ returns and he argues it's the, the bright Shekinah glory. It's Jesus Christ glorified brighter than 10,000 suns. Well, that is. That would instill a, a different kind of terror, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah, I mean, the world, the world, you know, going pitch mm-hmm. black. You know, you, mm-hmm. you know, you've seen nights like that in in Montana. Um, you know, just well, you probably get to see more of the stars, uh, but there's just dark, dark times. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, and then all of a sudden, boom, you know, it, man, man, that's that's. Mm-hmm. Do you know, I mean, that grabbed my attention in that, well, that, that, hey, that's quite an entrance. That would be very mm-hmm. shocking. That'd be terrifying for unbelievers. Yeah. But for believers, I think it'd be very comforting. You oh, know, I'd, you know, I'd be like, like yes! And, and you're caught up to see him. And in the right. book, um, in this book that we've been talking about a lot, right, you know, right. the early church would even talk about, Hey, why are believers caught up to meet Jesus Christ in the air? And the author, you know, argues, Hey, the, the early church writer on it. Um, Oh, which one was it? Mm, I'd have to look it up, but uh, he doesn't even try to give a defense of, of his uh, argument on it because it, of why of Jesus Christ, you know, catching believers up to, to meet them in the air. Um, but, but, you know, I, I I mean, just the return to Jesus Christ. Um, I think it'll be full of awe and splendor. Um, his, as Spurgeon and others would say, Hey, his first coming, he was clothed in humility and, and shepherds saw him and kind of your nobodies. His second coming, I believe, will be just radically different, clothed yep. in power and majesty, a conquering king, more of a, instead of a sacrificial lion, like at his first coming, he is a, a sacrificial lion, a sacrificial lamb. Right. You know, he's a roaring lion. He takes possession of the earth. He comes, he conquers, he he condemns, uh, you know, and it's, and he clothed in, in majesty and power and honor. I mean, it's just two radically different comings as well. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah. Which is part of the reason why I'm historic pre-mill. His right. second coming will be radically different than his first coming. Right. Right. And that he's, you know, that that I I, I believe that he deserves before eternity. I believe that he before the eternal state kicks in. I believe that he deserves for all nations to recognize him as king mm-hmm. it's his inheritance it's his due that that nations and kings and kingdoms that every tongue tongue tribe and people would declare that jesus is lord and that it would that it would happen in this that in the in the period of time before time itself is taken away and which you know the post mills will say yes yeah, that's through the gospel I'm like no it's not it's not just through the gospel it's it's through conquest you know it, it's him going out to conquer and to con- you know as a conqueror to to conquer um, you know and that every that that everything needs to be made right 
and he's going and he's the one that in Jesus everything all God's promises are yes and amen and mm -hmm. that they're not and that they're not merely they're not just spiritual promises Just well and the gospel has been preached throughout the nations these past two thousand years right and its message has been essentially unless you repent you shall perish right and so all these kingdoms all these nations these past two thousand years have heard have heard that message right. unless you repent you shall perish and so that goes there's so much unity there with psalm 2. right um, Right. And it's not it's not teaching that they all oh what's the word I'm that they're all Christianized. So right. Right, you know, so I'm I just you know for me it's Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Hmm. Um that that's my cry is is Maranatha. Yeah, I, I long for that day. <laughs> well with that, hey guys. Thanks for joining us for chat. I, I'm sure that we're not done. It sounds like no. Daryl was talking about having what a part two, yeah, with probably with uh, Violet and Pastor Pastor E. Um, so we look forward to that. We could have a, a really good chat there, and they'll have some good some good uh, things to point out as well. I'm sure they'll walk us through all the royal psalms. Um, which you know a lot of times premillennials don't point to the royal psalms and it's you know um something that that i think we ought to do more of but yeah yeah with and that i'll give you the last word and then we'll call it a day yeah uh so again uh you know wherever wherever we may land um you know on these matters uh you know we do we all land that jesus is returning um Let's unify in that. Let's have unity in that. We can have the in-house debates and discussions, even robust ones over. Um, but let, let us do it around the table uh, where we're eating and you know drinking with one another um, and, you know, and having those robust debates, you know, to the glory of God. You know, let those uh, discussions be seasoned with salt. Um, you know, we can we can rib one another. That's fine. That's cool. But uh, let's let's do it to the glory of God and for the glory of our King, uh, who is who is going to come, um, and all all knees will all eyes will see him and all knees will bow. All right. Thanks for joining everyone, and with that, we will see you in the next live stream.